consider the possibility of some danger to not only your reputation but to your person. I mean, there are people do react rather violently to some kinds of charges, or particularly if they're true, there's more apt to be a negative reaction than if they're false. If they're false charges, then they can be reacted to in a normal way, by a libel suit or whatever. But uh, a true, if there's truth in it, there can be a danger in that situation. We've seen that happen in other cases. John arranges to meet Troy Bonner, the young man he sees as the key to the cover-up. He's in great danger. The reason is he carries the secret, so to speak. He served his purpose for the FBI and others by committing the lies that put the seal on the cover-up. He knows that Troy's evidence will be crucial to Alicia Owen's case, and Troy wants to tell the truth despite very real fears. Uh, my fears are that, you know, I'm not gonna be believed again. It's just, you know, gonna be a whole other kind of exploitation like it was last time. You know, and afraid that that's gonna happen or, you know, I might end up dead, or a loved one might end up dead. Troy has an overriding reason for putting the record straight. Maybe somebody has a better idea. I want this to go forward and, and have something done so that all those other kids who a lot worse things have happened to can come forward and see that action can be taken. You have to, if you want to protect yourself and your life and your family's life, both now and particularly in the future, is to use the institutions of government that have been set up to protect you and make them work. That means you go into federal court, you go after the people that have done this cover-up, and you expose it so there's no longer any percentage on their part in eliminating you because the secret's out. Yeah, that's why we're here today, to, to, look, to, to let it out. John's advice to Troy to tell the truth in court puts him at risk of prosecution by the county attorney's office. Potentially, they could decide to charge him with perjury because now he is telling that they forced me to lie. I did lie at Alicia's trial. I did lie before the grand jury. I did it because the authorities were forcing me to do it, and I was scared for my family. Potentially, they could charge him with perjury this time. Troy's appearance in court will keep Alicia Owen out of prison. She's on bail while DeCamp appeals against her perjury conviction. As her hearing approaches, vital new evidence emerges. Alicia claims that some of Troy's videotaped testimony was withheld from the grand jury which indicted her. The tapes that were shown to the grand jury had been edited. Everything that matched Troy's statement was shown them. That matched mine. Because I know it's, it's was edited out. And I think maybe one of the things we want to do is show the judge specifically how where these, you know, little five minute segments of look, this tape says this, and then show him it isn't in this tape. And this is the tape the grand jury saw. I'm going to attempt to get these tapes and we'll see what happens next. But to obtain the tapes, DeCamp must approach some of the very officials he has accused in court of being involved in the cover-up, the county attorney's office, which ran the grand jury. In the good old Alicia Owen case, 127-194, I'm trying to get the evidence, the tapes and the transcripts of Troy and Danny, Troy, uh, Troy Boner. Yeah. Up at the county attorneys, they have all the bills up there. Oh. Robert, let me guess, Robert Siegler has them. Robert Siegler is the prosecuting attorney trying to send Alicia Owen back to prison. After lengthy negotiations, DeCamp emerges with the tapes the grand jury never saw. Camera was uh, $4,000, I bought $4,000 in cocaine. Okay, and what airline? In more than two hours of taped testimony, Troy details trips across America on behalf of Larry King and Alan Baer. Trips for drug deals and sex. It corroborates Alicia's evidence. Did anybody go with you? Alicia Owen. For John DeCamp, this is the proof of the King's sex ring for which he has been waiting. Here are 
word is, so to speak, the smoking gun that they could go out and verify, the corroboration. In other words, the linkage to King that was denied. Cover-up. Organized, planned, deliberate cover-up. The courthouse, Wahoo, Nebraska. The hearing begins. Alicia Owen is ready to testify. So is Paul Bonassi. But there is no sign of Troy Bonner. De Camp discovers that Robert Siegler has sent the young man a subpoena. Fearing arrest for perjury, Troy has gone into hiding. De Camp is without his most vital witness. In court, Alicia's case is adjourned. The county attorney's office begins to search for Troy Bonner. But county attorney Siegler won't say why. I'd like to ask you whether you're about to charge Troy Bonner with perjury. Oh, no. <laughs> Every victim witness who stepped forward in any way or even was a potential witness that somebody heard about has either been killed, put in jail under some theory or other, terrified or run out of the state, discredited. Every perpetrator, every perpetrator, even the convicted ones, have been treated as conquering heroes. Peter Citron lives in the same house where he abused many of his young victims. Alan Bear lives in the most exclusive part of Omaha. He recently bought a downtown shopping mall Many of the other abusers named by the children have risen within Nebraska's state government and legal system and within the Republican Party. Obviously, the FBI was protecting something a lot more significant than a bunch of old pedophiles having improper relations with little boys. They were protecting something a lot more significant than a bunch of drug peddlers. They were protecting, in my opinion, they were protecting some very prominent politicians, some very powerful and wealthy individuals associated with those politicians and the political system, up to and including the highest uh, political people in this entire country. In search of the men who protected Larry King, John DeCamp goes to Washington to investigate King's connections in the Republican Party and on Capitol Hill. Paul Bonassi provides him with the evidence that Larry King threw child sex parties here at his rented $5,000 a month Washington house. I was about 14, about 1981. At first it was about three or four times the first year. After that, about once a month. Some of the parties, when they started off, were straight political type parties with no sex. And then when some of the men had left, some of the politicians had left, the ones that had planned on engaging in some type of sexual activity, uh, that would come after the party. Some of the kids would be held downstairs in some of the rooms where if they acted up or if they started freaking out because of the drugs that they were on, they'd put them in a room that they couldn't get out of and they'd lock them in. What kind of drugs? Anything you wanted, cocaine, uh, heroin, speedballs. You're uh, telling me speed. those things were at these parties where you had Larry King and prominent politicians? Yes. Were they readily available to anybody at the party? At the after parties, they were readily available for anybody. Beforehand, they did it more uh, upstairs than they did anywhere else, and it was kind of in the back rooms. Were any attempts ever made that you know of to, uh, to expose this situation? As far as I know, nothing's ever been done. And most of the people that were in there had already been, I guess you say, compromised. King's partner was Washington lobbyist Craig Spence. Spence took youngsters, including Bonassi, on private midnight tours of the White House. So you were in the White House then? Yes. And how, how did you gain access? Well, I came down with uh, Larry King, but Craig Spence was the one that arranged the trip for us. And it was kind of a, a gift for our services that we were doing. How many times were you on this kind of a trip? I came to it on two times. Two times? And 
Were you used for sex on those occasions? None until after we left. After you left the White House? Yeah. What it's, time of night? It was usually around uh, midnight. For me, it was just kind of weird being in the White House at that time of the night to go into places that the guy was telling us that uh, nobody gets to go to. I mean, we seen, I seen rooms in there that uh, I'd never even heard about. And Craig Spence and Larry King had a couple of groups. One was called Bodies by God, and they had the Call Boys. And there was another group that was started by Larry King, which was called the Golden Boys, which was kids that were usually under the age of approximately 10. Here's some uh, headlines out of the Washington Times. You don't see this in the L.A. Times or the New York Times, by the way. This is June the 30th, 1989. Power broker served drug sex at parties bug for blackmail. Craig Spence, who's identified, I think, in this article, and one of, if not this one, the one I'm going to show you in a few minutes, um, was with the CIA, and his job, along with some other and nefarious individuals was to set up the congressmen, senators, uh, dignitaries uh, for blackmail. There was uh, one FBI agent in Omaha and another one in Chicago, a team of five, who traveled around the country and did some of their dirty works. The, there was a restaurant in New York City that was bugged, video and audio specifically for the purpose of setting up congressmen, dignitaries, senators, etc. Homosexual prostitutes and probing snarls officials of Bush and Reagan. Paul Benassi has drawn, drawn the living quarters of the inside of the White House. The public is not allowed in that portion of the building. I've been in the White House, but never there. And uh, the next major case I'd like to mention is the Nebraska case. Um, in 1988, I received a phone call from Lincoln, Nebraska. One of my college friends said, Ted, you better get back here. There was a major investigation uh, headed up by John DeCamp, former state senator, a good friend of mine. And uh, John had uh, taken on the task of exposing a group of high-level politicians in the state of Nebraska and some of the top businessmen. As a result of this case, uh, the kids who were part of the network came forward. There were 80 children because of the publicity on a pedophile a pornographic arrest. Four of them gave statements. Uh, two of the four later recanted. Two stood by what they originally initially said. And what we developed there was that children were being taken out of orphanages and foster homes, driven to Sioux City, Iowa, 184 miles away, and flown to Washington, D.C. for sex orgy parties with congressmen and senators. Uh, the person in charge was a fellow named Larry King, a black man, not Larry King Live. And he was uh, president of the Franklin Savings and Loan, which was a savings and loan established to help the minorities. He had a salary of $17,000 a year. He was paying $5,000 a month for a condominium in Washington, D.C. for these parties. As a result of the investigation, we learned also that there was an international child kidnapping ring operating out of the Midwest and all the way into Washington, D.C. Uh, Paul Benassi, one of the kids who I interviewed for five hours, I've got him on five hours of tape, by the way. I need to make that tape available to you, but I'm so busy, I'm kind of like a one-armed paper hanger, that I just haven't had time to do it. But Paul Benassi, when he was uh, 10, 11, 12 years old, was recruited by these people to be one of them and to act as a, a, a buffer and in shopping centers, parks, public places, to attract the children at his age over near the car, the adults in the, involved in the ring would grab them and uh, they would kidnap them. Uh, the kids, uh, of course, talked about satanic cult ceremonies. They talked about the kidnapping ring. 
Paul's life has been uh, turned upside down because he refused to recant, as did Alicia Owens, the other person who refused to recant. Alicia's still serving time in prison for lying to the grand jury. She was convicted of that. When she was 14 years old, she had sex with the chief of police, Bob Wadman. That's what she said. And the other kids backed her up. Other uh, top businessmen who were identified were Harold Anderson, publisher of the Omaha World Herald, the head of the Society Page in Omaha, uh, Eugene Mahoney, who was a former vice squad police officer in Omaha and uh, is now head of the Forestry Service for the state of Nebraska, and the list goes on and on and on. The uh, pedophile ring, homosexual pedophile ring, uh, they were transporting these kids from Omaha to Des Moines to Minneapolis to Milwaukee to Madison and back to Omaha. So, um, unfortunately, the investigator prior to my entering the case, Gary Caradori, uh, had learned about some pictures. And these pictures were the smoking gun of the case. Pictures of politicians having sex with children and other unbelievable acts, boys and girls and so forth. So uh, the official photographer of the group was a fellow named Rusty Nelson, Russell Nelson. And Rusty was a farm boy from Nebraska. He had never seen the bright lights of the big city. And uh, he uh, was enamored with uh, the rich and the famous and the jet airplanes and the trips around the world, actually. And he was a professional photographer, and he started out by uh, working in a gay club, taking pictures for the club, and he was recruited from there into the, the, the sex ring. Uh, Rusty was not himself homosexual, I'm convinced of, but I've spent quite a bit of time with him. He, um, in connection with uh, his uh, work, uh, would sneak a reel, a roll of film in on occasion when he was photographing these acts because they were taking the quote official film away from him as soon as it was completed. Rusty sent these pictures back home and he also scattered them around the United States, negatives and photographs themselves. Uh, he was sold for sex by Larry King to a businessman in Washington, D.C., and he said to the businessman, let me go in the bathroom and wash up, and instead of coming back out, he went out the back window and he disappeared. He was living on a farm, his, one of his parents' farms in Nebraska for quite a while, and the FBI came around to his parents' home asking for Rusty, and uh, the mother said, well, he's over at such and such a farmhouse. They went over and interviewed him. And of course, uh, it was basic, as he told me, it was an harassment. And then he left and had to uh, go into hiding someplace else. He, his folks came back several months later to the farm to check it out. It, was, it had been abandoned, it was, but it was a beautiful place, a mile and a half from any neighbor. And somebody had gone in with high-powered rifles and totally destroyed it, tipped over the furnace. They shot 13 bullets through the refrigerator door, front, out the back, and out the house. You know how a powerful weapon that had to be. They shot bullets into the ceiling and out the walls. There was a van outside uh, that was running. They shot it up, broke all the windows. Rusty, I asked Rusty, in fact, I asked him on camera, and I'll tell you a little bit about Rusty in just a few minutes, in addition to what I'm telling you now. How and who would know that uh, this was there, that you were there and so forth? He said the only people that knew were his parents and then the FBI. He's convinced that this was a tactic by the FBI. John DeCamp, the state of senator, state senator, who was really headed up the whole investigation and who, by the way, has obtained a $1 million judgment um, has uh, been diligently uh, working on the case and has refused uh, to back down. Uh, Rusty 
after the FBI interviewed him on his farm, decided he had to hit the road. And so he obtained um, a van and some window washing equipment. This is pretty clever of what he did because he knew that they'd be tracing him, looking for him. And he drove all over the United States, in and out of towns, and washed windows. No record of a pay stub. Uh, but unfortunately, about three years later, uh, they caught up with him in Portland, Oregon. And uh, he was arrested for having a, a broken taillight. In the back of his van, he had pictures of nudes, which professional photographers do on a regular basis, nothing pornography. And the police told him that there was a juvenile picture, a picture of a juvenile in the back of the van, uh, and therefore they arrested him and he was sentenced to two years in prison. He never faced his accuser. They would never tell him the name of the person who was supposedly a juvenile. Rusty's out and on probation. When he gets off probation, I located him in a farm in Oregon. And I drove from Las Vegas up to Oregon, picked him up and brought him back. And uh, then I said to Rusty, I said, Rusty, let's go look for those pictures. And uh, Rusty said, good idea, let's go. So last uh, October, November for two and a half months, Rusty and I uh, lived out of the back of my pickup truck. Nothing fancy, a four-cylinder Nissan that could barely get up the hills in Colorado. And as a matter of fact, on one occasion, it stalled. <laughs> we were going up through this pass and I just couldn't go any higher, even in first gear. Anyway, Rusty had a number of locations where he placed these pictures, at least he said that. Uh, there were five in Colorado. We went to the first one, which was an abandoned uh, mine mill. He had placed them up behind the rafters toward the back of the mill. The pictures were gone, but there was a dynamite cap there. The second location was uh, up about two miles up a mountain. We went up there and it appeared that those pictures had been washed away. The third location was a mine. We found the mine and it had the steel door on it, so we couldn't get in. The fourth location was in a cave on the side of a cliff near a waterfall about 300 feet straight down. And Rusty had weighed 165 pounds when he hit it in that cave. He now weighs about 240. So uh, we went into town and I got a nice uh, rope, good rope that hold 2,200 pounds as I recall, a harness hooked it on the back of my truck for safety, and we lowered him down. Well, he slipped, and it was getting dark, and he hurt himself, and unfortunately, because of the difference in the weight, 165 to 240, he couldn't pull himself back up. So I, we, I had a handy talk. I said, Rusty, uh, let's, come on, we'll come back next year. Come on up. So we finally got him up, and we went on our way. Uh, and going back to the farmhouse, where somebody shot it up, and I, would have to say it was probably the FBI. Rusty had hidden some of the pictures under the desk, the top of the desk, in the farmhouse. These are pictures of some of our leading politicians having sex with kids, okay? And that when we were there, we examined it, and of course the desk had been pried open and the pictures were gone. The question then arises, well, Rusty, how do I know there are any pictures? And if there were, how do we know that somebody came along and got them? And how would they know that they were there? Rusty told me when he was in jail in Portland, um, he thought he was doped, drugged. And uh, they'd come in, guards and other men would come in at night and, and interview him. And he thinks he may have told them at that time where some of the locations of the pictures are. But there are some other locations that uh, there's no need to discuss them here in detail. Uh, but as a result of that trip, and really the real basis for the trip, is to do a video, do our own video, Rusty and John DeCamp and I. Now, on the back table back there, I've got a videotape that says Conspiracy of Silence. Let me tell you about this, and this is where I came up with the idea to grab Rusty and go find these pictures. 
There was a TV crew from Yorkshire Television in England that came over in the early 1990s. They were here for seven months, and uh, they filmed this whole case, the one I'm telling you about. It was to be aired on Discovery Channel, May the 4th, 1994, and even listed in the TV guide. But at the last minute, somebody came in and bought up the rights and ordered that all the copies be destroyed. I hold in my hand a bootleg copy of that show. <laughs> and what we are going to do, Rusty and I and John DeCamp, we're going to complete this story, and nobody's going to buy us off. I don't know if we can get it on Discovery Channel or not, but we're going to do our own video. We're going to basically include the information here on this video, and we're going to update it. We're going to include the $1 million judgment. We're going to include information about more details about the kidnapping ring, and including an interview with Noreen Gosh. Noreen Gosh's 12-year-old son was kidnapped back in 1982. Johnny Gosh. There's a book out. It's called Why Johnny Can't Come Home. And I was supposed to have a case up here tonight, but um, something happened. I guess, I don't know, maybe they're in the mail someplace. But uh, Paul Benassi helped kidnap Johnny Gosh. And he gave us a statement to that effect. And uh, they uh, took Johnny uh, that first day. He was kidnapped on a Sunday. He was uh, delivering his Sunday Des Moines Register. Took him to a safe house in Sioux City, Iowa. He, they kept him there. And according to information developed by the mother, Noreen Gosh, uh, the snatching of the child was ordered by a fellow named Michael Aquino. Michael Aquino, head of the Temple of Set out of San Francisco. This is in her book. And Michael Aquino wrote me a letter because I quoted him someplace and challenged me on it, but I said, hey, it's in the book. It's in Noreen Gosh's book. Anyway, uh, young Johnny and another kid ended up stealing a car, and uh, they went into hiding. They lived on an Indian reservation for quite a while up in uh, northern Minnesota, and uh, it was they were discovered there, and they had to move on. Yeah, Johnny Gosh is alive today. I know approximately where he is, but he doesn't dare come forward because he knows too much. He knows too many people who are involved. The, uh, the video, by the way, that, that uh, back there on the back desk, is uh, I'm selling it for $30. And if you decide to buy it, the second video will be sent to you free. But if you do buy it, there's a sheet back there. And I want you to be sure to sign your name and address and so forth so we can get that second video to you. Along with the video, uh, you get a free CD. There's a story behind the CD. It seems like everything I do, I, there's a story behind it, okay? This CD is called, uh, it's a song by a fellow named uh, Dave Pesnell. It's called Judas of D.C. Now Dave, I've known Dave about 20 years, and uh, he bought... Uh, quite a bit of land outside San Bernardino, California, worthless land basically, that's why he got it so cheap. He learned there was a water uh, table underneath it. He made a deal with the Japanese, uh, into some Japanese private businessmen. They were gonna build a plant because of the water there. He went out one day to inspect the land. He was met by soldiers, U.S. Army uniforms, with automatic weapons told uh, get off the land. You can't come here. Dave ended up going to court. He lost in court. But what they didn't know about Dave, or if they did, they didn't do anything about it, he's a musician. And so he wrote this song, Judas of D.C., and it talks about how we are being double-crossed by the Washington gangsters. It doesn't matter if they're Republicans or Democrats. There's not a dime's worth of difference between any of them. Okay? But this, is, this goes along with the videotape if you decide to buy it. Also, here's something else that's very interesting. In the trial, which resulted in a $1 million judgment, I have the transcript back there. It's uh, probably 160 pages. Um, it's available, and it's fascinating reading, fascinating reading. I've accumulated 22 years of research and written these own books for myself. 
I might make five, six bucks a book, okay? So you don't get rich doing this. In fact, you go broke doing it. Every dime I have, I put into this cause. So um, I urge you to buy some of my reports, my personal reports, and make copies. I'm not in this because I'm, there's nothing back there copyrighted. Buy it, make copies, spread the word, okay? Now, um, there's, there's something else that I need to bring uh, to your attention. This is a book about the CIA, the finders. This tied back into the Nebraska case. The finders is a CIA covert operation, as far as I know it's still operating, that was established in the early uh, 1960s. And their task at hand was to kidnap children. Going back to the Nebraska case, what do they do with these kids that they kidnap? Paul Benassi has attended six auctions where they auction children. Anyway, any age from three and four all the way up to 21. They put a tag around their neck. They're in their underwear. They have a number on the tag. And people down below bid on them. The kids sell for between Fifteen to fifty thousand dollars. I've even heard of one kid going for a hundred thousand. Well, who's buying them? According to Paul, you can't afford that, huh? Okay, you don't want it either, I'm sure. According to Paul, they're one of the locations outside of Las Vegas, about fifty miles outside of Las Vegas, and I located it. It's an airstrip. I went up with a friend of mine, and we found it. And uh, there were airplanes there. There were campers there, uh, and uh, there were uh, men who, with foreign accents, there was a police officer there, at least somebody in a uniform. The kids are auctioned off and put on the airplane, and nobody knows what's happened to them. Now, in the last four years, we've had, we meaning, I network with a lot of people, of course. We've had information from two airline employees, one in Denver, Colorado, and one in Los Angeles, LAX. In Denver, Colorado, I happened to be lecturing there that night that this occurred. And an airplane with 210 children was being fueled in Denver. The employee who was working there asked one of the adults, there were two men and one woman, What's going on here with these kids? She said, Child Protective Service is none of your business. Mind your own business. Those kids were being flown to Paris, France. Okay? In uh, Los Angeles, LAX, another one of my sources received a call from an airline employee. Same situation. Different plane. And these kids were being flown to Paris, France. There, in 1997, there was the Adoption and Safe Families Act of 1997 that was passed under the Clinton administration. And what that did, it took children who were abused out of the biological home, put them in foster homes, and then put them up for adoption. Okay? And you don't know this, or maybe you do, but if Child Protective Services receives even an anonymous phone call from a neighbor and that neighbor says that that parent slapped that kid, they can come in and grab that child. The title of the act again, Adoption and Safe Families Act. Yeah, It's not Safe Families Act, it's Safe Kidnapping Act. There are 3,000 children who are taken away from the biological parents every day of the week. A friend of mine, good friend of mine, in fact, I used to have a radio talk show, I had a radio talk show for two years. Um, and uh, her name is Suzanne Schell. She had her kid taken away from her. She was like Noreen Gosh. She wasn't going to stand for it. By the way, Noreen's been on every TV show in America, too. And uh, in addition to this book, Why Johnny Can't Come Home, uh, she's done a tremendous job. And if every parent who lost a child 
would do what Noreen Gosh has done, we wouldn't have this problem. Okay, Suzanne Schell, she's a fighter too. And she wrote this book, Profane Justice, Comprehensive Guide to Asserting Your Parental Rights. This book points out that in 1974, four to five children a day were dying of child abuse. In 1997, four of five children a day were still dying of child abuse. The only difference was that half of them died in foster homes. Between 1997 and 2002, the goal of the federal government is to double adoptions by offering financial incentives to remove children from their homes and terminate parental rights. Of all the children taken from the biological parents, placed in farm, uh, foster homes and then uh, for adoption, of all the children that are taken, only 37% return home. So what's happening to these kids, okay? Well, I just recently learned, and I don't have any, I've got a lot of material for the screen, but you know, I'll get to it in a minute. Uh, anyway, what's happening to these kids is they're being placed in the foster home, and then they're being adopted. And once they get into the system, they're adopted, you don't hear about them anymore. They are gone. Okay? I suspect that some of these kids on these airplanes were adopted children. There is a network of criminals that have set up a money-making scheme at the expense of our children. When a child is placed into adoption, the federal government gives the state $4,000 for each child and up to $6,000 for special needy child. There's a racket going on in America today where the kids are being placed into adoption. And let's say, for example, Joan Smith, say four or five years old, is placed up for adoption and is adopted and is gone. That same person is then changed to Joan Smithley and then they change the name again they change it four times and then they adopt that same person 75 times 79 times four thousand dollars is a lot of money and you have you have this network of criminals you have attorneys you have judges who are involved in this. That's not all. That is not all. Then what happens is once the adopted parent gets the child and starts receiving the money, and by the way, they go on Medicaid right away too, by the way. Once the adopted parents gets a hold of that child and who knows what happens to the kid of course the in this particular area in the southwest this network of criminals files a lawsuit against that person and collects the money okay and then that person who is set up as the adopted parent receives their cut the networks receive a cut the judges receive a cut because they're, they're involved in phony lawsuits. This is going on right today. The person who gave me this information, and I, again, I just received this about two weeks ago, went back to the Clinton White House and talked to them about this, contacted the FBI and talked to them about this. Nobody is doing anything about it too many high-level people involved. Okay, let's, uh, let's scoot a little. By the way, uh, the Finder's Report, just a minute, let me think. Make, the Finder's Report is back there, and I'm going to put it up on the screen for you for documentation about our great CIA. The great CIA is not only involved in adopting, I mean, kidnapping children, they're the biggest drug dealer in the world. As we know, Iran-Contra, 
And the CIA is the most evil organization that's ever been established in the history of the world. And the FBI is right along behind them. The FBI is involved too. I'm going to document information on the screen now about the finders. I have been to the FBI a half a dozen times and filed a formal complaint and they have yet to interview me or to even contact me. Okay? And uh, let's start. Oops. Let's talk about, before I go into the finders, let me just throw a few things up here about, no, this is the finder. Reader's Digest, July 1982, 100,000 children miss, are missing every year. We're not talking about runaway teenagers, we're talking about kids that are two, three, four years old. They just disappear off the street. The great FBI will tell you how many bank robberies occurred last year. How many uh, uh, statutory rapes occurred? They'll tell you about armed robberies and ca uh, stolen cars. They won't give you figures on the missing children. Here's the finders. That's the great seal of the great CIA. This is your documentation. This has been given to the FBI by me personally. The top says uh, Department of the Treasury. U.S. Customs. This is a case that broke in 1987. And at that time, there was a, two well-dressed men in a van, Dodge van, that uh, were with six children, ages, as you see down here, two to six and seven years of age. They were in a park. The kids were shabbily dressed. The men were very well-dressed. The men had passports on them. The police went out and talked to them and the children said that they were en route to Mexico to a smart school. Uh, the men refused to talk. The information was, the van had Virginia license plates on it, and the information was sent back to the Washington Metropolitan Police Department, Washington, D.C., and the files were checked there, and they learned that there had been information there about blood rituals that had taken place, and possibly a homicide. And, uh, by the way, the Metropolitan Police Department obtained a search warrant, and that's where they came up with this information. Uh, there was a much more detail on it than what I'm giving you, but this is the report itself. And if you'll notice down here at the bottom, inspection of the premises revealed that organizations in different places in the world were involved in this project. And you see here, it says, London, Germany, the Bahamas, Japan, Hong Kong, Malaysia, Africa, Costa Rica, Europe, and so forth. And there was a Palestinian aspect to it. And here's this kind of interesting. There was one a code word called uh, Operation Pentagon or bre Break in Pentagon. Is, is it on there? I don't see it right now. Yeah. It was a code word. Yeah, okay, here it is. The Pentagon Break in. Obviously a code word. So what happened? The customs agent uh, who investigated this was in contact with the Metropolitan Police Department. He went over there for a briefing to the Metropolitan Police Department in Washington, D.C. On April the 2nd, and uh, he w had been working with the detective Bradley, um, and at that time he was referred to a third person, probably somebody didn't want his name in his report, and he was advised that all the passport data had been turned over to the State Department for their investigation. The State Department in turn advised the Metropolitan Police Department that travel and use of the passports by the holders of the passports was within the law and no action would be taken. This includes travel to Moscow, uh, North Korea, and North Vietnam in the late 1950s and the mid-1970s. Well, 
It was illegal to travel in those countries in those days. The individual further advised of circumstances which indicated that the investigation into the activities of the finders had become a CIA internal matter. The Metropolitan Police Department report had been classified secret and was not available for results. I was advised that the FBI had withdrawn from the investigation several weeks prior and that the FBI Foreign Counterintelligence Division, that's Division 5 in headquarters, which handles all counterintelligence and counter espionage and so forth, uh, informed uh, the uh, Metropolitan Police and Customs uh, that they should not furnish the information to the Washington Field Office, which is the investigative uh, arm of the FBI in that area, not headquarters. No further information will be available, no further action will be taken. That's the finders. That ties into the Nebraska case. John DeCamp has made the statement publicly that the one organization that did more than anybody else to cover up the kidnapping ring, the case in Nebraska, the pedophile ring, the homosexual ring, was the FBI. John DeCamp who is the attorney on record for these kids, two of these kids, has publicly stated, and it's in his book, the, the Franklin cover-up, it's in, on the back back there. If you don't have it, I highly recommend it, along with this video. Johnny Camp has stated that the one organization that did more to cover up the Nebraska Franklin cover-up situation, cover-up case itself, was the FBI. Alex and good evening, everybody. Welcome to our show tonight. Going to be, well, Friday TGIF. I got to tell you, it's um, <laughs> it's a it's a welcome night. I'll tell you that. I can't believe how absolutely, utterly, completely tired I get during the day, and it it, it seems like right before I'm going to go on the air, I could just. I close my eyes and I'm and I'm off, so it must be just all the excitement. But I I want to welcome all of you and, and and thank all of you for for being with us not only tonight but you know all the time on especially our last four shows or last three shows and tonight is the last one. My guest host will be with us in a little while, Ted Gunderson, and we are I'm still waiting to hear if we can get one individual on with us. Uh, we're going to have Noreen Gosh back on because I want I want to see if Noreen uh, has any comments, any suggestions, uh, just any good words for us because it's got to be just so, so hard on that woman. And in addition to that, the individual, and I talked to him today, I guess it's okay if I use the name, he doesn't know if he can come on or not. His attorney has advised him not to, and that is Rusty Nelson. Rusty Nelson is the photographer, or the former photographer. He is a photographer. The former photographer for this individual who seems to be the kingpin in this uh, child abduction, whatever you want to call it. I don't know, but uh, Larry King, and not our friend Larry King, who is on television, but Larry King from... Uh, well, from Nebraska, I guess, and then he uh, he was in prison for I don't know how many years, and now he's, as we were told by Jim Rothstein, he's back in Washington, D.C., carrying on his area of expertise. Anyway, Rusty Nelson is the, the man who was the photographer for so many of the events that took place, and I talked to Rusty, and he would like to come on. He told me a story which was so... Overwhelming, so sad, but so typical of what we are all fighting. And and I can't help. I want to thank all of you for the for the wonderful comments that you've had so far, and also for the the comments that you had about John DeCamp last night. And as as you all said, and I and I said, and Ted Gunderson also said, is that we could feel the pain in John DeCamp's voice. We could feel. The at least trepidation, and if not abject fear. 
and his dear friend who is now departed for the same reasons, William Colby, former head of the CIA, told him. He said, John, don't go there. Back off. Forget it, because there are some things you can't fight. They're too big. Well, I, I, I respect anybody's opinion, anybody's choice in that. But I have to make my choice, too. And I, I don't even know at this point how, how we can fight this evil. Because it goes beyond what we would consider evil. Anyway, hopefully tonight, Ted and myself, and at least Noreen Gosh, and hopefully Rusty Nelson will have on. And we can figure something out. And so we'll talk about that tonight. I'm so glad that Rusty Nelson has agreed to come on with us. And what I would like to do, and I know Noreen Gosh is listening, I would like to keep Rusty on for about an hour with Ted and myself. And then in the last hour of our show tonight, bring Noreen back on and then kind of wrap up the whole week. But Rusty Nelson has some incredible information. And, and I'm going to ask each of you to listen because Rusty has a story that's, that's sad because of what's happening to him now. And... If you can find it in your heart, and I know because many of you know the financial position we're in, and, and, and you help us out. Rusty Nelson is, at this point, because of what he elected to do, to step forward, to help stop this, this horrendous thing going on, Rusty's destitute. The government took away his means of support, which was, uh, Rusty, as I said, was a photographer, and he was just starting out after breaking away, and we'll hear that story, from the evilness of what has been going on. And the government came in and not only took and then destroyed everything he had, cameras, computers, uh, his, his files, everything, but they threw him in jail. And we'll find out why. But if, if you could in some way, maybe you could help this man out. And maybe, just maybe, we will all figure out a way that with all of us working and exposing it, shining light on it. Remember, you shine light on these, on these roaches and they will run away. Maybe, just maybe, we can stop it. It's, it's not easy. And it's not easy for any of these people, but it's something that we all have to do. So if, if Noreen is listening, Noreen, I would like to be able to call you at 9 o'clock our time, mountain time. And then you, Ted, and myself would be on for the last hour. And it will give us time to have Rusty Nelson for an hour with us and hear his story and some of the things that he knows. So everybody stay where you are. I'm going to get my co-host, Mr. Ted Gunderson. Quite a guy. I like Ted. I like him. Please stay where you are. I'm Alex Merklinger, and this is Mysteries of the Mind on the Millennium Radio Network. And I'll be right back. Yeah, everybody, we, we are back. I'm, I, I apologize for uh, taking a little longer than usual, only because, well, only because I wanted to hear the end of that one song. So I was talking with, our, with my, my co-host and really a special, special guy, and that's Ted Gunderson. Ted, welcome back. And it's almost a shame that it's, uh, that it's Friday and, and, our, and our series is about over. Well, uh, thanks, thanks, Alex. Uh, thanks for having me on for the for all four nights. It's uh, been a great experience. I really enjoyed it, and uh, we've really pumped a lot of good information out there. And from what you tell me, uh, told me a few moments ago, we've got a very, very special guest coming on. Yeah. At uh, the top of the hour, and it will really be great to hear from him. He is one individual who is right in the middle of all this. Right. 
Yeah, and I hope Noreen, and I know she is listening, and, and I just want to, because I won't have time to call her ahead of time, but uh, we will have Noreen Gosh on the last hour, Ted. Okay, good. And then um, just hear from Noreen and anything that has happened and some of her ideas as to what we can all do. Sounds like a great idea. Yeah. Um, you know, um, I've had, uh, let me just tell you my experience with Rusty. Okay. So, okay, you want to announce who's coming on? Well, I did already, so it's... Oh, did you? Okay. Yep. It's Rusty. Okay, Rusty Nelson. Oh, Rusty right. Nelson was the photographer, and he'll he'll go into much de- more detail than this, yep. uh, for the group from uh, 1987 to 88, for about a year. Hmm. And uh, Larry King, this is Rusty's story now, sold him for sex to some fellow in Washington, D.C., in a motel room. And Rusty wasn't in that. He's strictly a photographer. And uh, so... The um, uh, the man came to his room, and Rusty said, let me go in the bathroom and wash up, and he went out the window. Wow. And uh, went to Nebraska and lived on one of his dad's farms. His dad's a very wealthy farmer. He has a number of farms. He lived there for about a year or maybe a little more. And then during that uh, period, the FBI was looking for him. They didn't know where to find him. And his mother, uh, told, not knowing the circumstances, they came to the mother and asked her where her son was, and she told him. Hmm. And so the FBI went over to the old farm, it was the grandparents' old farm, and uh, talked to him. And then Rusty took off. And um, he uh, made his way cross-country in, uh, I think, a hearse. He did have a hearse at one time. I think it was in a hearse. And he uh, was able to handle it financially by going from town to town and offering to wash windows. He's a, he's a great window washer, by the way. He's washed my car window many times. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and so Rusty then, I'm giving you folks a little background before Rusty comes on the air. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if Rusty's listening or not, is he? I, I don't know, but I hope he is. But I yeah. can't. I, I I don't know if he is even capable with you know because he had so many of his things uh, stolen by the government. Well, yes, that's right. And so what I'm I'm giving you just the, the highlights now. And so Rusty uh, is uh, traveling across country, and he has these pictures of uh, these prominent uh, Washington D.C. celebrities and others, politicians, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, right. uh, who were. Uh, involved in these activities with these children, sexual activities, and the parties of Larry King, Larry King, the second party after the first party. And uh, he also is a, prof- as I said, a professional photographer. And so, as he, if he would see a beautiful a young lady or a person, he would take their, he would offer them the opportunity to be a model, take their pictures, and so on and so forth. He gets to uh, Portland, Oregon. Now, in the meantime, he's stashed. Uh, some of these pictures around the country. And he gets to Portland, Oregon, and the police stop him because they say he had the taillight out. They probably knocked the taillight out themselves. And they uh, arrest him, and they confiscate uh, several hundred thousand photographs in the back of his hearse. And they tell Rusty that one of the photographs back there, because no, nobody's going to look at a couple hundred thousand photographs, one of the photographs in the back of the truck is of a an underage girl. Now, I've been with Rusty when he's approached these girls to see if they wanted to be models, by the way. And he always says, now, if you're underage, I don't want you, and I want you to sign this waiver. And they always sign the waiver if they're not underage. Anyway, the Portland police claimed he took a picture of one of these young girls who was underage. They arrested him. They tried him without him facing his accuser. He didn't know who this supposed witness was. He frankly does not believe there was a witness. And he is uh, sent to jail. And while he's in jail, this is Rusty's story to me, because I spent two and a half months with him here a couple years ago, traveling all over the West Coast looking for the pictures, by the way. Hmm. And we'll get into that, I'm sure. And while he is um, in jail, he told me that uh, men in suits would come in and interview him on a regular basis. Now, you have to understand there's a good possibility Rusty's another one of these mind control victims. Hmm. And so um, then 
I heard that he was out, and he was hiding on a farm in Portland. He was still on probation, but when he got off probation, I called him and I said, Rusty, let's go find some of those pictures. Jumped in a car in Las Vegas, drove to Oregon, about 900 miles, and took our, I took to Rusty off the farm and we started looking for the pictures. The first place we stopped was in Oregon. And the pictures weren't there. They were in an abandoned shed. The next place we stopped was in, we drove on into Colorado. And he had hidden these pictures in a, a, in a uh, mine, abandoned mine. Jeez. And we arrived at the mine. It was way up in the, in the Rockies, like 13,000 feet. And the mine had a big steel door on it. We couldn't get in there. And then another place was, it was under a waterfall. And so I went out and bought uh, a harness and rope and everything. Uh, uh, and uh, we were there about, it was getting dark. And uh, when Rusty hit these pictures in the first instance, he told me he was like 160 pounds. Now he weighs about 225. <laughs> so so I'm, I'm photographing this from afar. <laughs> And Rusty goes down on the harness and the rope, and the rope is tied to the back of my pickup truck. Yeah. And he slips, and he can't get back up. And it was dark, and I said, Rusty, look, I don't want to be responsible for you having a serious accident. Come up, and we'll go back there one of these days, someday in the future, okay? That was the other one, the second the third place. And the fourth place we went uh, he said it was way up, about two miles up in the mountains. We parked along the side of the road. This is outside of uh, Durango, Colorado. Sure. Yeah. And this is kind of interesting because there was a pickup truck there ahead of us in the, pulled off to the side of the road. Hmm. It had uh, Washington plates on it, but I noticed in the back window it had for sale in the Colorado telephone number, 303 telephone number. I didn't think much of it because they were there ahead of us, by the way. Yeah. So Rusty and another young fellow uh, went up into the mountains. I started up and I couldn't make it. Uh, you know, the atmosphere and the oh, sure. lack of oxygen and all that. You so bet you. I came back and sat in the car with the reporter, Pat Shannon. There were uh, four of us, by the oh. way. He'd driven up from uh, Mississippi to join us to look for these pictures. And then uh, while they were up in the in the mountains, and Pat and I waited down below for quite probably several hours. And the first young man came down, and he said that the individual up there, apparently in the pickup truck, who came down ahead of him, he saw him talking to Rusty, and when he came down and took off, uh, Rusty and the other young fellow were still up there. And then Rusty came down after the uh, uh, other young fellow uh, who went up with him, and he came down and he was saying, lions and tigers and bears. What? Lions and tigers and bears. And he didn't know who I was, didn't know who anybody was. He was, uh, somebody triggered him. That fellow, whoever he was, triggered him. Wow. And he knew, this other, this individual obviously knew the location and knew where Rusty was going and knew what he was heading for. And he, they beat him there. They beat him to, a, mm. to that location. Now, we didn't find any there, okay? The Westy came down. He said they'd been washed away. It looked like they'd been washed away. So then we went to Taos, drove down to Taos, New Mexico, and he had hidden the uh, the pictures in a, an old abandoned car. Uh, and I think that might have been the hearse that he hid the pictures in. Mm -hmm. And um, we couldn't find that hearse. We hit some junkyards, and, and we hit a house where he'd stayed, and they didn't know anything about it. And so, uh, but also before we went to Taos, John DeCamp drove over there with Rusty. And the sheriff met him at that location. I don't know if this is the same uh, location we were looking for. Then we can ask Rusty that. And the sheriff met him and told him to get off the property. Wow. So the sheriff knew they were there ahead of time. Uh, there were every indications that they knew where we were as we went along. You know, they have this GSP where they can track you. And when they, sure. My car is a homing device, and I'm sure it's uh, being tracked every place I go. Because on a regular basis, in fact, it's, I stopped and had wounds today. 
And while I was having lunch, uh, somebody took my direction signal and said they knew where my car is at all times. <laughs> <laughs> and I just, I really don't pay much attention to it. Right. It's so common. But anyway, uh, going back to Taos, New Mexico, we didn't find them there. Hmm. So then I drove Rusty back to uh, Nebraska from there. And we went to the old farm. And you would be shocked to see the old farm where Rusty uh, was interviewed by the FBI. What? It was totally destroyed. There were bullet holes. What? Yes, bullet holes through the wall, through the ceiling. The heater was turned over. The place was torn apart. Uh, there were bullet holes in the, through the refrigerator with high-powered weapon because it went through the front door and through the back of the refrigerator. Jeez. It went out the house. These were not 38 slugs. Yeah. And I said to Rusty, I said, Rusty, who knew you were here? He said, the only people who knew I was here was the FBI. My gosh. So um, now recently, now that's not the end of the story. <laughs> So uh, we took pictures of of the old house and everything, and uh, and then uh, Rusty, and then I had to I had to go out. I'd been there for two and a half months, by the way. Yeah. And by the way, in Colorado, it's thirteen, fourteen thousand feet in November. It's cold. <laughs> and I slept in the cab of the truck, and Rusty slept. We had a you know some sleeping bags and everything. He slept. Uh, we threw a tent kind of over the back of the truck. He slept in the back of the truck. Mm. Uh, but. Um, and then uh, I, I had to come back. I was I, I was gone for two and a half months. I'd spent all my money. I think I spent about ten thousand dollars on that trip. Oh my gosh! And uh, we didn't find the pictures. I said to Rusty, I said, Rusty, why why did we find the pictures? And he said, Well, I, I the only thing I can think of, he said, is that when these men came in and interviewed me in jail in Portland, I'm one of my personalities may have told them where these pictures are located. Wow. And um, so uh, that's uh, basically, uh, and then here recently now, uh, he, uh, in Nebraska, at about the same the time that Jeff Gannon's uh, story came forward and yeah. that situation was exposed, Rusty, well, first of all, Hunter Thompson was suicided yeah. and Rusty was arrested for um, failure to register as a sex offender. Oh, jeez. And Rusty, so then here about a month ago, about six mm. weeks ago, I jumped on a plane and flew back to Nebraska, got him out of jail. His, his parents are so disgusted with him. They don't understand the situation. Rusty was a nice young man off the farm. He went to the, to Omaha. He was a photographer in one of the nightclubs there. He was approached and uh, solicited to be a photographer in the, for this group, and then he got into it up to his eyeballs, mm. uh, flying all over the world in private jets. Uh, the staying in the nicest hotels, et cetera, et cetera. You know, he saw the bright lights for the first time in his life. Yeah. And uh, so anyway, so here about a month or so ago, um, I heard that he was in jail in Lincoln, so I flew back and uh, posted bail for him. Uh, it was only $10,000, I had to come up with $1,000. And then Rusty and I spent about, uh, I guess, almost two weeks there. Hmm. And we talked, and we went back to the farm, took some more pictures, and... Uh, also, I did a, about a two and a half hour interview uh, with Rusty, and it's on camera. Uh, on 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 camera, and I and I told Rusty I wouldn't release that without his permission. By the way, so right. sure. uh, that's where we are at this time. And uh, Rusty is a, he's a nice young man. He's destitute. We need to help him. I talked to him this morning. He said he had I think six dollars in his pocket, and that's all. So I'm sending him a, uh, in fact, I've already got it in an envelope. I'm mailing it to him uh, today. And uh, that's our guest, I guess, in about 10 minutes, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, Ted, this is amazing you know, because when you realize we're talking about stuff that our government has done to this man. I mean, destroyed him, um, threatened him, took his livelihood away, and yet they're they're famous for that because they do it. If, if you step on their toes, they will get you. Well, they sure got him. Yeah. They destroyed his life. Now, he was arrested in uh, Norfolk, and then he went down. I, I brought him down to Lincoln, which is, I think, I forget how many miles that is, maybe 100 miles. Uh -huh. And he uh, he had to re... Uh, he, uh, when I got him out of bail, he immediately registered. And because he, did, he didn't consider himself a sex offender, 
because the charges are taking a picture of a minor, right? So he, he has not been accused of any real sexual offense. Well, were these um, sexual pictures or what? No, they were not sad. They were pictures of a lot of girls who were models, according to him. Hmm. They were. Uh, they may have been nudes, but they were not sexual. Okay. And uh, so anyway, so I, uh, I, I went back and talked to Rusty and got him situated, and and he's living with uh, a woman now who's. Uh, it, it's not a sexual thing. It's a, she's a friend. I met her, uh, and then Rusty and I and this lady. Uh, we would go to the um, to the different uh, places where they feed the homeless. Let's let's get Rusty on, okay? Okay. Everybody, stay where you are. Ted Gunderson and I will be right back with our with our first special guest tonight, Rusty Nelson. And everybody, we are back. And coming back, I want to, of course, bring our our uh, guest host. Ted Gunderson on with it, but also a very special young man, somebody whose story you are you're going to be amazed at, and that is Rusty Nelson. Rusty, thanks so much. Oops, thanks so much for joining us on on Mysteries of the Mind. Well, thank you. I appreciate it, Alex. And uh, try and talk up as loud as you can. I don't know why this thing is acting oh, like that. Is that better? That's a little better. Yeah, Ted, you there? I'm here. Uh huh. Okay, sir. Rusty. Uh, well, no, number one, I, I want people to understand a little bit about you, who you are, how your involvement started with this, with this whole sordid story that, that we're all into. Could you kind of uh, give people a little bit about your background and, well, and where, where we stand now? Well, I've been a professional photographer for almost 25 years now. Um, when I was first starting out and getting established, I was, you know, a starving artist, and I got hooked up with Larry King. I was going to this bar and taking pictures. They were doing drag shows. It was a, a gay bar, and so I started taking pictures of the drag queens mm -hmm. and selling them to the performers, so... You know, it kind of supported me in that. Well, things got a little bit slow, and I mentioned to the owner of the bar that I was looking for some work. I was hinting to him that, you know, I could use the job there, but it was slow for them, too. Right. There was another man sitting there, and he piped up that he knew somebody who would be very interested in having me go to work for him. Hmm. And that just happened to be Sam Soda. He was the, the man who said this. Well, lo and behold, he hooked me up with Larry King. Yeah. And I had no idea who Larry King was. And, and let me interrupt you a minute. Larry King is a black man, not Larry King. Right. right. Yeah. It's yeah. Right. It's Larry King, uh, he had the Franklin Credit Union in Omaha, Nebraska, which a lot of people are very familiar with. Right, you start in the Republican Party. Yeah. He yeah. Was, Okay, I didn't uh, interrupt you, Rusty. I just wanted to get that across. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, that's where where this all came in. And yeah. the next thing I know, I was getting all brand new clothes and and being flown all over on um, private jets and you name it. So, uh, so Larry King had been into his deal quite a while when he first uh, met you and hired you. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And this was what year, Rusty? I believe it would have been probably 87. I thought you said uh, seven, 87 88, right? Yeah, yeah 87 88. Right. And, um, you know, that was um, where, where, where I came into the um, pictures at that point. So... Um, you know, it, it was amazing. Here I am, you know, a little plow boy from northeast Nebraska and grew up on a farm with a good family and all this. And yeah. then all of a sudden, uh, here's this, what looked like a very wealthy man huh. who's shown interest in my work. And, you know, it was one of these things where it was unbelievable because, um, 
here here I am, I'm getting um, brought into a whole other lifestyle, the, the rich, the famous, the, the movers, the shakers. The bright light. Uh, mm. Oh, yeah. Mm. Like that airplane. Yeah. And, you know, at first it was, everything was all hunky-dory. I, I didn't see anything wrong with anything at all. And he had me sit in his office at the at the credit union and he'd have meetings and, and that. And I was there. And then pretty soon I started to realize I was there as the eye candy. And, as the you eye know, candy. I, I got to looking at this. <laughs> Um, you know, trying to figure out what was going on. And the more I looked at it, the more I saw that there was some big problems. And I noticed that there were a lot of in, indiscretions and, and that that shouldn't be. Uh, it didn't take me long to figure out there were two sets of books at that credit union. Wow. Just from what was being said. Uh, my family... My older brother is in the money business. Uh, he's a certified financial planner. And uh-huh. He's um, worked for various banks and that. So I knew a bit about what the money game was. Uh-huh. And, you know, the different things that were being said and how one thing was being told to one person and something totally different was being told to another. Hmm. And supposedly they were talking about the same thing in two different meetings. Yeah. For example, what would they be talking about, Rusty? Well, the financial end of what was going on at the credit union. Okay. And Larry had no idea that I had any idea what financial things meant. And you're pretty Uh, sharp about knowing when to talk and when not to talk to. Well, I try. (laughs) No, you are. I've been around you enough to know that. (laughs) I stick my foot in my mouth sometimes when I really shouldn't, or open it way too wide when it should be shut. (laughs) But, you know, I'm I'm a photographer. I'm basically the wallflower. I see everything. Very little escapes me. Up up to this point, Rusty, what was Larry King having you do? Just as you said hang around and, and look like a pretty boy, or, or were you yeah, actually that, photographing? Supposedly I was to go, going to work for him as a waiter. He oh, did wow. a lot of catering, and he had a new um, uh, restaurant and jazz. There was a jazz nightclub called Prince's Palace after his son, Prince. <laughs> and I was to be a waiter. Well, I spent very little time there working as a waiter. Yeah. And, you know, needless to say, I had very little income, but I had almost anything anyone's heart could desire was um, brought to me, basically. Uh-huh. And the finest hotels, the nicest limousines, jet planes, you name it, um, expensive clothes. He spent $4,800 on clothes on me one morning. Um, you know, it's just... Just amazing. Most people would never, ever in their wildest dreams be able to imagine this stuff. Well, the, what, what then, Rusty, was going on as uh, when, when King flew you all around and, you know, kind of uh, showed you off, what, what were you doing? Just there looking pretty, or, or did you understand what he was doing? Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. What what uh, what were you doing and what was going on during this initial phase when you just first started to work with Larry King? Well, we were going around. He was doing fundraisers and things like that. You know, five thousand dollar a plate. You know, um, suppers and, hmm. and things like that. And I was there to take pictures of these parties. Okay. Okay. Well. Lo and behold, afterwards, he was having another party with a few select people, and this was a sex party. Now, were you and aware of it at the time? Not not until later on. Wow. You know, it was into it a few weeks before I started getting the um, indoctrinated, basically, into this. Yeah. And, you know, he had it all scheduled out, basically, how he brought a person in. <laughs> and the steps that he went through to get them um, indoctrinated, basically. 
and are initiated into what they were doing. And it was one of those things where by the time I figured out what was going on, I was in to it to the point to where I knew I had to protect myself somehow. Yeah. And that's where I went in, and I would take pictures from the hip. That's where I'd keep my camera down by my hip. Oh, okay. And I'd disconnect the flash cord. Mm -hmm. And I'd usually drop in, I'd, I'd keep a spare roll of high-speed film, and I'd drop that in and go ahead and start shooting that way and get pictures of some of the people and who they were with yeah. and a little bit of what they were doing. So it wouldn't be so bizarre because that's where the way Larry always said it was that um, if something goes down, nobody will ever believe you if anything's ever said to them about what's going on. Meaning the people that were there and their yeah. position in government and society. So they were so, so prominent. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, there was one night where there was a presidential limousine. Oh. And the Secret Service had swept the place beforehand. Yep. And they would kept it secured for a couple days. And, you know, that's what went on. Was that the first party or the second party? It stayed for the second. Okay. Wow. So, you know, it, it was one of those things where these people, they, you know, even to this day, people think that I'm full of it by yeah. relating to them some of the things that have went on. And, you know, I was... Um, to the point to where I realized what was going on, I knew that if I was just to go to somebody and say that, you know, this is what's happening, sure. they would basically squash me because I'd watched uh, Robert Rodman, he's the chief of police in Omaha at that time, right. um, take a stack of $100 bills of probably an inch and a half two inches thick or possibly even thicker, hmm. which I figured would be about $50,000. And this, from what I understood, was a weekly payment that he received from Larry King. A weekly? For what? For basically keeping things hushed up in Omaha. He would have no problems with any of his things that were going on. Yeah. And Wadman would go to the second parties a lot. And, you know, he would get in on a lot of things that a police chief shouldn't be partaking in. Yeah. Or <laughs> there were seven parties in Omaha and in Washington, D.C.? Oh, yeah, and New York. And there's various places around. Um, yeah. Larry King, he had, um, to give you an idea of how much pull this man had, um, he uh, sang the, the national anthem to open the National Republican Convention in 1984 and again in 1988. I and he had, I believe it was 84, wasn't it, when um, he rented the uh, ranch that South Fork or Dallas, yeah, that's right. the TV show, yeah, that's and right flew people over there yeah. um, to have a great big party out there. And if I remember right, John DeCamp actually got to go to that party, and he said it was just the most lavish thing he'd ever said or seen. And, uh, Rusty, on these uh, the second parties at night, was it uh, strictly homosexual with young boys, or was oh, it young boys and young girls? It was predominantly um Men with men, with boys. Is that right? But um, it didn't stop at that. He had both, you know, whatever anybody's tastes were, he would cater to them. And, you know, it was an eye-opening experience. How many boys would be at these second parties? 
it depended on where the party was. It might just be a handful. There might be a dozen. You know, it, it depended on what was going on. Yeah. And, you know, it was basically Larry King was a pimp. And the credit union was just a front. And how, about, how about the girls? How many girls would be there? Usually just two or three. Hmm. There wasn't usually very many girls. So in other words, if they preferred girls, they were still available. But oh yeah, yeah. Boys, your girls were available. Yep. So and they were all pretty young. Oh yeah. Um, there, I was probably one of the oldest ones around. And I was in my mid twenties. Wow. How old were these boys and girls? Um, they could be anywhere from probably eight, ten, twelve years old, all the way to um, usually their early twenties. And where where did they come from? Some of them came from Omaha. Some of them came from New York, or he had them out in Washington D.C. It just he could pull people out of the woodwork from anywhere it seemed like. Now, how about Los Angeles, Las Vegas, San Francisco? Oh yeah, he he had people all over. Now, did you have parties at all those cities? What's that? Did I didn't have parties at all those. I didn't go to the parties. Personally, in all those cities, but I know that they did have parties at different yeah. places. Now, Rusty, with with your knowledge of what has happened and what was going on in retrospect, do you think these kids all were uh, kids that had been abducted and then went through this mind control program and mind training program? Um, not all of them. You know, a lot of them they were street kids. Yeah. And he had a way of finding people who would. Um, not be missed, and they would um, uh, basically he'd find somebody out on the street, and he'd bring them in and get feed them, clothe them, give them a real nice, glamorous life. Yeah. And next thing you know, it's payback time, hmm. and that's what he would do. So he was a con artist. Oh, yeah, big time. Yeah. <laughs> to but go along with it, huh? Yeah, he didn't live in the ghetto for nothing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> did, but, you, did you take pictures of these sex acts? I shot pictures from the hip. You know, I didn't actually sit there and focus and, and take pictures of yeah. the things. That's what they wanted me to do, but I did not want to get into that. And, so you were taking pictures from the hip to protect yourself. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's what I was doing. And in federal court... They did have a guy that um, that was taking the pictures, and I'd seen him on, on about three different occasions. And one day, we were out in Washington, D.C., Larry King had Nancy Reagan's hairdresser come and cut color and perm my hair. Oh, and anyway, he got all these new clothes, and he would say, you wear this, 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 or that. And... You'd be at this place at a certain time with your camera. Hmm. And I'd be there and dressed like that, and then he'd have me go somewhere else, and it was change clothes on the way and wear this. And what they were doing is putting me out in front of all the people and uh, basically showing me off as the photographer. Hmm. And they um, were showing me off, and in the process, um, what they were doing was having this other photographer shooting the sex parties and the little kids and snuff films and stuff like that. Snuff films? No. Yeah. yeah, that's where they actually go out and kill somebody on film. Yeah. Right. That's yeah. one of the things that Larry really wanted me to get into. And I, I wanted no part of that whatsoever. How, how did you resist that, Rusty? Oh, I have ways of sidestepping a lot of things if I can help it. Yeah. And that's basically it is, you know, I got offered a tremendous amount of money to do these. And, you know, it was, I, I turned them down because I didn't want to get into legal problems. And the amount of money wouldn't be worth it for what the uh, 
results would be in the fact of just having to live with the, the fact that you've done this. Rusty, how often was Larry King making these uh, snuff films and, and, and even the, uh, the pedophilia uh, parties? How often were these going on? Oh, the parties were a couple times a week, a lot of times. My gosh. You know, it, it was a weekly event, basically. Yeah. And yeah. what about these snuff films? Did he do those indoors or outdoors? They were usually done in out of the way. You know, they were um, places that, like an old farmhouse or something like that, yeah. where they would sacrifice somebody. Who, who, would, who would they sacrifice? Basically, they'd take one of the kids. Were the kids that had been kidnapped or otherwise? I guess. You know, as far as I can tell, that's where where they come from. And you Did know, you get a chance to talk to any of these kids? Oh, there were some of them I got to talk to. You know, you didn't get to say too much because Larry always seemed to have an ear on everything. and You never knew who was going to rat you out. To him, yeah. you know, if you said something, and he was a very vicious man if you crossed his path. Did right. he torture you? Oh, there have been a couple times. And, you know, there was things where I was beat around a little bit, and, and um, you know, it was quick pressure on. And he knew how to blackmail a person very well. Yeah. My gosh. How did he blackmail you? Well, basically, he was said, you know, you've been around this. We'll we'll take and tell your folks that you're gay. This and that. The next thing, you know, we know where you live and and your family. They're not safe. Um, that's where we're at. Um, you know, basically, he would make you to where you were very uncomfortable if you didn't do what he wanted you to do. Uh, the, the the film that you shot from your hip, Rusty, yeah. uh, that was film that you kept for yourself and they didn't know about it? Yep. But that's what about the other film, film, huh? That's the film that Gary Caridori got killed over. The, the, the film from the hip? Yep. Wow. Yeah. Now, did you but keep any... That, did they didn't know you were doing this, of course. No. Larry, he'd, he'd have the film for me and... If he gave me five rolls of film, he expected five rolls of film back at the end of the day. Yeah. And, you know, if it was anything that might be um, damaging to somebody or that, he made sure that he had the film. Right. And I was basically sneaking in an extra roll of film. Mm. And that so instead of five rolls of film, you had six and seven rolls of film. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know how I carry film around. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've seen you operate. Yeah. But Rusty, how, how about this? Um, the other fellow, the other photographer, who who did take the incriminating pictures and also the snuff films. Okay. Getting back to where I was saying about federal court, this came up in federal court. Um, what was it? February fifth of ninety nine, in Judge Warren Urbom's courtroom. Um, in the Paul Bonacci versus Larry King trial. Right. Um, um, he took and came up with uh, the uh, um, the extra photographer came up. And you there? Yeah, we're here. Okay. Yeah, it sounded like I got cut off. Anyway, that came up, and they had me take off my shirt mm. and show them that I did not have a scar on my right shoulder. And the photographer that was filming the sex parties had a scar on his right shoulder. Oh, okay. So. What happened to him, Rusty? What's that? What happened to this other photographer? I have no idea where he's at, if he's even alive. Really? Uh, and you, did you know his name at the time? I was thinking it was Nick. I I'm, I'm, can't remember exactly what it was. I don't have any of my papers to go back through and look. Yeah. Uh, Rusty, what an incredible experience, I have to tell you. I mean, just you hear the stories. I'm, I read some of the testimony from Paul Bonassi yeah. and the stuff. Um, 
up at Bohemian Grove. Did did you ever go up there? Yep, I've been to Bohemian Grove. What what kind of uh, what kind of things were going on up there that you saw or that you photographed? Well, they've got a a forty foot owl up there that they burn in effigy, and if I remember right, his name is Hola, and it's sort of a satanic ritual type deal. And for those people who don't know what Bohemian Grove is, this is where your laws are made. It's not in Washington. It's mm. not on Capitol Hill. It's all cut and dried before it gets there. Wow. These, the Bohemian Grove is a very, very elite, select, well-guarded club. I mean, it is... Uh, creme de la creme. And who attended the Bohemian Grove and how often did they meet? I don't know how often they met. I don't know how for that time. And anyway, they would go out there and it was a good old boys club, basically. And that's where your laws were basically made. Your banking was taken care of. Um, <laughs> You know, things like that, that that would deal with your everyday life um, would really come to be. And it was it, it was just absolutely amazing for a yeah. boy to see mm-hmm. this. And who would attend that Bohemian Grove? It was all your movers and shakers that um, worked behind the scenes, basically the ones that didn't like being in the limelight, but they made the things happen. The people that were in the limelight, for the most part, were just their puppets. So you mean were they there also, the celebrities and the politicians? Well, some of, the, some of them would be. But, you know, your politicians and that, some of those would be there. But the people that really would make things happen, you know, like the world banking and things like that, um, those are the people who took part in these. And that's where a lot of the stuff films were also made, wasn't it? I believe so. I don't know for a fact, but no. I believe so. You... From what I, what I understand from what I've seen, you know, that's like I tell everybody when I do an interview, it's, this is what I've seen, um, it's what I believe, and, you know, I believe it to be true. Yeah. And I have no... No reason to be making any of this stuff up. You know, my gosh, no. I got mean, out on the line big time even just talking to you about this. Sure. Well, I can imagine. What about uh, kidnapped kids? Were you aware of some of these kids being kidnapped? Yes, i come to realize that was happening, too. And, um, you know, it's these people were really... Um, they were ruthless. You know, they would go out and they had catalogs where they would have pictures of kids. And somebody would pick out a kid that they wanted and they went and um, they would go kidnap them to order, basically. And, you know, this is basically what happened to Johnny Gosh. Yeah. Did you ever meet Johnny Gosh or know him? Oh, yes. Oh, you did? Can you tell us about that? I can't say too much about it because of things that are going on right now. But, um, you know, he was brought into something that would, you know, it isn't his background. You you know Noreen, and she's a good lady. I mean, she's a wonderful person. And, you know, he basically was brought in, made into a sex sex toy. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that's what all came up. The kid's extremely bright. How how old was he, Rusty, when you uh, met him? Or, or And also the last time you met him, too. Oh, I don't, I don't have any idea how old he would have been. Uh, uh, well, how, how many years ago was that? They would have been back in 87, 88. Oh, okay. Well, he was 12 years old in 82, so. Yeah. So he'd have been uh, 17, 18 years old. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, that's. 
sounds about right. When you talk, when you talk to Johnny, uh, did he talk to you at all about his background or the circumstance of his kidnapping? We couldn't get into that much because it was always, you know, you didn't know who you were talking to, hmm. and you didn't dare say too much. And you didn't dare ask too many questions either. That's right. <laughs> you know, it's like Larry would always tell me. I used to, I used to be very good at remembering people's names and their faces, and he basically would drill it into us that you don't remember who, you don't remember what, and you don't remember what their name is. Yeah. When was the last time you saw Larry King, Rusty? I would have been. Um, in Washington, D.C., right before I escaped out the window. You can tell us about that. I would have been in 88. Um, I, I don't travel well. I'm one of these people that needs a couple of days to uh, regain my composure, basically, after I've done some traveling. And, and we'd just flown in, and I went upstairs to sleep, and... You know, just relax a little bit. And next thing I know, here's a knock on the door. And this Jewish guy comes in. And, you know, he goes, are you resting? I said, yeah. And, oh, how can I help you? You know, and he goes, well, you're mine for the night. And I go, what? And he says, yeah, I bought you from Larry. Hmm. And I went ahead and went in. I had my clothes in the bathroom. And I luckily had my billfold and clothes in there. And I left all my equipment there, and I escaped out the window. And I went home, got everything out of my apartment, and I went and hid in an abandoned farm place. Wow. Um, for almost, well, going on a year. And no running water or anything like that. Huh. And, um. And do you think, um, Larry King was looking for you? Oh, I know he was. <laughs> I know he was. Well, Russ, you said you went up the second floor at the hotel, but you went out the window. You, did you drop down to the first, to the ground from there or what? Yeah, I, I jumped out the window. It was, it was at the, um, house on Embassy Road. Oh, it was at the house? Yeah. But that wasn't a hotel room, I thought. No, no, no. So you didn't have to go to the, to the fall on no a whole flight of stairs or anything? No. Okay. No. And so anyway, I got out there, and um, it was pretty touchy. And then, I, you know, after the Franklin deal blew up, yeah. you know, I, it got the news and all that there for a while. It made international news. And then here... It came what was around New Year's, I believe. I started getting lonely out there by myself on on that farm. <laughs> so I thought, well, I'm going to go to the Max. That was that bar that I'd been taking the pictures out of the mm. bag cleans for New Year's Eve. And I did. And lo and behold, I got to talking to some of the old friends and they asked, well, where are you living? And I told them. And, you know, it's, um, oh, yeah, we'll write you this or that. And the next thing, I was getting my mail from a few miles away and that. So next thing you know, here comes the FBI pounding on Mom's door, and they went ahead and they just ransacked her house hmm. without a warrant. And that they were looking for me and for pictures and whatever else. Well, they came back again, done it to her again, and she told them where I was at. So they came over and they ran track my house. Hmm. And interviewed you. Yep. And they got me all worried and that and, and put on the spot. And then they um, went ahead and, and here's a two-story house. And, and they just ransacked the, the main floor. They didn't even go upstairs. And lo and behold, if they would have went upstairs, they would have got much of what they were looking for, for pictures of that, of the, you know, the who's who and, yeah. and that. But the other thing is, is they didn't go through any of the outbuildings. 
the barns, the haystacks, or anything else that are on a farm that you'd normally hide stuff in. Why do you think they didn't? To scare me. To harass you. Harass me. Keep hmm. my mouth shut. Wow. And it ended up a lot of problems in the family because of that. And right now, um, Dad and I are, are not even on speaking terms. So we well, Rusty, then you, then you left there, didn't you? What's that? You left the farm then. Yeah, I got kicked off the farm because of that. Oh. So I ended up going on the road. Um, and, well, actually for a while, I lived in Lincoln, about a mile away from the state capitol where all the, these, um, all the, the different, Things were being investigated by the by the um, unicameral, which is our we have a, one body of uh, legislative government here in Nebraska, yeah. and it's mm. like your Senate and House combined, and they were doing all these investigations into it, and they they were looking for me high and low, and they couldn't find me, and here I was a mile away from the state capitol. The police even came to my door one night. I was having an art show, hmm. and so anyway, you know who you were. But yeah, you know, they knew they knew who I was. They took my driver's license even. Wow! And you know, I, I thought, oh my God, it's all over with. And they harassed me for about fifteen minutes, and then let me go back in to my home where I had the art sh- uh, the art show in my studio. And it was just a matter of moments before the whole place cleared out because nobody wanted to be around me because the cops. Yeah. Boy, and boy. So that pretty much ruined my chances of making any money off of the art show. I didn't sell a thing that night. <laughs> so. so then where did you go after that then? Well, I went on the road. I'm, I went ahead and I, I knew things weren't quite right. And I just went on the road, and I never stayed in any one place for much more than three weeks. Wow. I would, I would lived in my van, washed windows, and did odd jobs or work temp jobs somewhere mm-hmm. for daily work, daily pay, you know, basically for nothing. Did you get, uh, pay, get paid by cash, or did you have to give your Social Security number? Oh, you have to give a Social Security number. Okay. That's how long it took me to catch up with you, about three weeks, huh? Yeah. Huh. And... You know, when I I could get a sense of when I was being followed, and if I felt that I was being followed, I'd be 500 miles away by morning. Wow. Yep. Now, Rusty, this went on for how long, and um, or or is it still going on? Because I know you also just recently had a lot of legal problems, right? Oh yeah, they threw me in jail right after Valentine's Day, two days after Hunter Thompson. Now, uh, just talking about Hunter Thompson, had you ever seen him, like, up at Bohemian Grove or anything, filming any of the snuff films? Well, he tried to get me to do a snuff film for him. Hunter Thompson did. Brokered brokered the deal. Yeah. And that's one of those things. You know, if he was presented to me as Hunter, and I didn't know who who he was right. until I seen his picture um, after he committed suicide, supposedly, but I think yeah. he was murdered. Oh, I sure, yeah. So that, that's just recently you knew that. Oh, yeah. But you, you met him and he wanted you to do a snuff film back yeah. when you were with Larry King? Yeah. Huh. And it wasn't just one time. It was multiple times that he tried to have me do this for them. Yeah. And yeah. it was a very large sum of money, <laughs> more than most people would make working a regular job in five or ten years. Is that right? My God. Yeah. Well, the snuff films sell for like 50000 each, don't they? Yeah, it was more than that. Is that right? Jeez. What, 100000 Yep. That, that's for one copy? Yeah, that was to do the original. Oh, okay. So, what a sad thing. Rusty, tell everybody what has happened, what the government has done to you, um, because I, I I want people to know 
literally the sacrifices that you and your your, your life now has has given in order to follow this and not do what you know is wrong, but because um, I know you're having a problem right now, and, and I'd like people to help you out. Oh, I appreciate that. Um, I have a lot of health problems as a result of this. Yeah, tell them about them running over you, Rusty. Oh, yeah. What, uh, what was this? <laughs> um, Portland, Oregon. I was riding my bike, and a car came driving up behind me at about 50 miles an hour, and they mm. opened their back door as I was going over railroad tracks and hit me with their car door. And I fell off my bike and hit my head on a railroad track. And mm. I now have epilepsy from that uh, seizure disorder. And you can't drive? Yeah, they took my driver's license away, and and uh, it's really not a good deal. I have to rely on other people for everything. You know, it's... Um, I take over four thousand dollars a month in medication. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and you have no money. Yeah. To get help with that I have to not work. You know, I'd I'd love to work. I wish I could. But if I do, then they take that away from me to where I cannot get any of my medication that I need to live with. Wow. And mm-hmm. nobody's gonna be paying me enough money to where after taxes. Yeah, I can come up with that much money each month just to buy yeah. my pills. Well, how, how do you make it, Rusty? So what you, how do you how do you make the four thousand? That's a lot of money. Well, it's different uh, assistance. I've, I've tried for Social Security disability, and that's such a joke trying to, to get help through the government. All yeah. they're doing is they sit there, they have their government jobs and they push the papers. And how many people do you know that have a government job where they actually help people instead of harassing people or, you know, tearing down trees so they can give you more paperwork to fill out Mm -hmm. and pass the buck on, no, we can't help you, but go fill out paperwork for the next one. And they can, you know, it's like getting disability if I got that. It's... $544 $544 a month is what I would have to live on. How do you pay your uh, your, your medical bill, 4000 a month? Well, that's, you know, like right now, the county is helping me out with that right now. Rusty, but how long ago for the month. How long I ago did this happen to you? Month. What's that? How long ago did this happen to you when this car went by and hit you? Uh, this was in 98. They put me in jail. Um and I'd gotten out and that for a while in 98, yeah. and this is when that happened to me. And they arrested you in Portland, too. Yeah, they arrested me. Um, well, it wasn't in Portland, but it was in Oregon. I was driving back home. I decided I was tired of running. I was going to mm-hmm. go back home. And so I went loaded up everything in my van, and I was driving back to Nebraska. And they arrested me in a little town called the Grand, mm-hmm. Oregon. And this was on Friday, the 13th of September, oh, in 1996. Now, on what charges did they uh, get you on? They um, arrested me for supposedly kitty porn. Hmm. And uh, I, they said that there was a girl I'd taken pictures of. And everybody I take pictures of, I get a model release from. Um, they have to be of age. They have to provide an ID. Right. And if at all possible, that's even notarized. Hmm. Okay. And, you know, they um, could not produce pictures. They would not produce the person. They said it was a minor, so they did not have to, to go in front of me in, in court because it would be too traumatizing for them. So... I have no idea who this person even is. Or if there is a person. Yeah, yeah. right, or if there is a person. It's probably, it probably never was a person. Yeah. Well, you were tar- you've been targeted ever since you went out the hotel uh, bathroom window in Washington, D.C. They've been after you, Rusty. Well, they were even after me before that. <laughs> you know, there was somebody who had got wind of what was going on, and they had the police called on me. You mean uh, 
when, when the was going on as far as your Larry King. And, oh, what, oh, really? Yeah, and that's where I first seen Rodman get his payoff. Wow. And that's just directly as a result of what went on. Yeah. Rusty, who, who were some of the uh, the leading politicians that you used to see at these the party, the second party? Well, um, I won't name too many names, but one is Bob Kerry. Yep. Senator Bob Kerry. From Nebraska. Yep. Used to be governor of Bob Kerry. Yeah. And uh, you, you, you witnessed him, what, with boys or girls or both? Both. Yeah. Gosh, you know the the sad thing is you you were just trying to get back on your feet. The government came in and and basically destroyed and stole all your equipment. You said. Well, I had to leave all my equipment when I left out the window, and they've basically um, destroyed my life. We were we set up a. Um, Wedding photography studio and, and portrait studio in Norfolk, Nebraska. And this is just recently, right? Yes, this was. We got the building the 27th of January. Uh huh. Oh wow. And I went in. We had the display set up, and we were starting to take pictures. And we really had done a tremendous job of getting things up and running. We were getting paying clients coming in and mm -hmm. everything. And it was. Um, what was it, the 16th, 15th, 18th of um, uh, February wow. that they came in and um, closed, they basically closed us down. They took all our equipment, they took the computers, um, they contacted clients, hmm. and they basically just ruined us. They did a smear campaign on, on the studio and myself. Now, was this the FBI? In the paper. I don't know if it, if it was local cops, the FBI, or who, or a combination of both. Yeah. I, they flashed the badges so fast I couldn't even look at them. When I asked to look at them, they wouldn't. Um, they did not read me Miranda rights when I was arrested. Hmm. Um, it was just not a good deal all the yeah. way around. What were the charges, Rusty? For not registering as a sex offender. Uh, and they claim you're a sex offender because of the pictures that yeah. you supposedly took in Oregon. Yeah, and I out in Oregon, I had gotten so sick that it started messing with my medication so bad that um, that in my sleep to this day, I still do not get a decent night's sleep. And uh, they would come in and they would only have to let you sleep a half an hour out of 24. What, that, that's would, the law? That's what they told us. Ted, that, Oregon, right? That was in Oregon at Multnomah County. This is the same jail. You may remember something about um, the people that were ended up dying in jail. I believe there were four of them. They died. Um, they were beaten to death Jeez. by the guards. Wow. And the guards had a fraternity. It was called the Brotherhood of the Strong. Hmm. And they came in, and, and they would beat these people to death in their jail cells. And nice. My gosh, no, I, uh, I have not heard about under that. The carpet. Uh, oh, this happened, I think it was a 2000, 2002, some, somewhere oh. in there. Well, um, one of the things that I'd like to mention is that most people do not realize what the prison system is like. Uh -huh. They, oh, yeah, we need stronger penalties for this and that and the next thing. Going firsthand, first off, if you put somebody in jail, if they are in there for a week and they can hold them for eight days for no reason whatsoever, right. they can put anybody in jail for eight days. And anyway, um, the prison system, you get into it, the first 30 to 60 days may be beneficial to a person. But if you go more than two months yeah. in jail, it is detrimental to everyone except mm. for the guards and the people who are running the penal system who are making their living off this. 
Yeah. It's a cash cow that they are milking, and they're milking it to death. Jeez. Um, they had a little town here in Nebraska where they bitched and moaned about spending $3 million on a new school. But they were more than happy to spend $14 million on a state-of-the-art jail hmm. that would house 40 people. Wow. Yeah. Um, and that was so they would have jobs. Well, $14 million put into an account, the interest off of that would make more than what the jail would. Absolutely. Sure. Yeah. Well, Rusty, have, have you been following this uh, thing in the news about this Jeff Gannon in Washington? And uh, I, I don't watch news very much of anything, but as for Jeff Gannon, um, the people who think it's Johnny Gosh, I don't believe you're very far off. You think it's right? I do. Okay. And... If you don't believe me, look at the look at his eyes. Yep. Look very closely at the eyes, and it's and for what I know firsthand, um, there was some things said last time I seen Johnny. Yeah. That it was basically put. Um, This was out of the farmer's market in, in Portland. Mm -hmm. And he said, wouldn't it be funny if... And he basically laid out the exact same scenario as what happened. And what's going on now. Yeah. 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 And, you know, like he said, he had the, the ways and means to get in to mm. do it. Boy. And... You know, how many people could get in to the White House on press credentials like he had? Yeah, but he had 200 times he got in there and he didn't even sign in. Yeah. Right. Well, it's just like Larry King going into off at Oil Air Force Base. Or yeah. The SAC, I mean. Um, that's Strategic Air Command. Right. And, you know, most people, they stop them at the guard shot shack and, and they check them out and this and that and the next thing. And Larry would drive straight through with whoever he had in the car. Hmm. It didn't matter. And they never stopped him? They never when I was with him. Unbelievable. How many times were you in and out of office? I, I don't even know. How so many? It was a few times. Yeah. Um, this is basically what they, they would... Um, induct people into the MK Ultra yep. project. So for the training. Yeah. That was the training? The mind control. Yep. Yeah. And, and who would they take in? Are these kids they kidnapped off the street? Basically, that's yeah. who they would take in. Wow. And, you know, they would run them through the, the paces. Yeah. And split their personalities to where they'd hear a certain tone or a certain phrase or, or whatever, a certain mm -hmm. person's voice. And they totally change personality. Did you uh, see much of that Dewan and Offit, Rusty? I seen some of it. I seen more of the fallout from it. Yeah. You know, uh, Paul Benashi, what is it? He got 13 different part personalities, isn't it, Ted? Yeah, at least, probably more. Wow. Yeah. And, you know, that's the things that I'd seen. Yeah. Um, you know, like these kids, I didn't get a chance to really talk or get to know a lot of them. Um, much more than acquaintances. And you didn't dare have anything more than acquaintances when you were around Larry. Jeez, unbelievable. He watched you like a hawk, didn't he? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Tell us about the, um, uh, the, uh, conversation on the airplane. Oh. <laughs> Larry King had a daycare center that his, was his little pet project in oh, Omaha. Um, it was basically to take in orphan kids or, you know, kids that don't have a place to go. It's a fox in the hen house. Yeah, exactly. Well, the guy who owned the building 
got wind that what Larry was doing. And he went in and boarded up the place, locked it up, said, you're not getting in, period. Wow. Well, they called the sheriff, the police, and all these here for state patrol, and nobody wanted to touch it. Mm. Well, we were on a jet, and I was sitting right next to Larry. He called Ronald Reagan direct. The place was open in 20 minutes. Is that right? My gosh. Mm -hmm. How do you know it's Ronnie Reagan? Because I listened to the phone conversation through the, he had the receiver next to his ear next to me. Hmm. And I could hear the voice. Did, what, uh, was that an 88? Um, yeah, that would have been, I believe, an 88. Do you think Ronnie Reagan knew what he was all about? Oh, yes, he knew. <laughs> okay. I, I know firsthand that he knew. Okay. How about the bushes? Would you comment on that? They know firsthand. Okay. They've participated, both father and son. Yeah. Rusty, tell us, uh, tell the audience about uh, when you returned to the old farmhouse after the FBI and found out that you had been there and you left. Tell, them, tell us about what happened in the farm, to the farmhouse. Oh, they, they just devastated the, the farmhouse. It, this farm was a show place in the neighborhood. Um, it was my grandparents' farm, and Grandpa painted the buildings, kept everything in just pristine shape every year. And anyway, the house was kept immaculate. And I'd left the house, locked the door, and it was completely livable when I left because I would pop back in and stay for a few days or whatever yeah. and just kind of have somewhere where I could get some sense of having a home. And anyway, when I was in jail, um, I called home and told my brothers, that I had some of, of these things hidden in the house. This is in Portland. I was in Portland in Multnomah County Jail. Yeah. And anyway, I called back to Nebraska and told the brothers I had the stuff hidden in the house. And they lived down by Kansas, and they drove all the way up here. It took them, took them about three or four hours just to drive up in the night that it was. It was a snowstorm and blizzard. Mm -hmm. And they still came up. And you when I got pictures in the house. Yeah. When they got there, there were fresh tracks. And the house had been just totally demolished. All the uh, appliances had been shot up. They found military shell casings in the house. Oh my gosh. And they called the sheriff. And the sheriff came over and, oh, yeah, it's just kids p partying in there. But they were military shell casings. Yeah. And brother kept a couple of them and mm. had them traced down, you know, find out that's where they came from. And they'd taken sledgehammer and beat the walls in. They busted up my desk. I had a set of pictures in my desk taped to the top of the drawer. Mm -hmm. uh, Didn't you tell your brothers that when you called them to, to yeah. go under the top of the drawer of the desk? Mm-hmm. Okay. And they found them all. So anyway, they'd been in and, and yeah. they had ransacked the whole place and they'd gotten what was hidden there. So they knew where to go under the yeah. top of the desk. And they were yeah. listening to your phone call in prison. Oh, yeah. Yeah, in jail, all, yeah. all phone conversations are recorded, all your letters are photocopied wow. and kept in a file, and they go through them. And oh my, my brother's phones were tapped. Um, he had found bugs on his phones huh. in his office. Well, it's, uh, a neat, it's a neat government we have, I'll tell you that. Uh, yeah. uh, there's another area here I'd like to ask uh, Rusty about, and that was uh, Gary Caradori. Tell us about Gary Caradori. Gary Caradori was the state's investigator, I believe. That was what his title was, wasn't it? Yes. yes. Yeah, he, was a, 
He was a state. He's a former Nebraska Highway Patrolman who was the state investigator for the uh, committee that was investigating the Franklin cover up. Right. Yeah. State committee. And so anyway, uh, he finally tracked me down. My mom and had got word to me that I really needed to talk to him and that he'd get it set up to where, um, you know, all things would be taken care of. And I still have a, they have a life. And, you know, settle down. I've never been able to get a family, you know, get married or anything. And it's the result of all this. Yeah. So, um, Anyway, I proceeded. I was down in Phoenix or Albuquerque. I can't remember. I think it was Phoenix. And I drove up to Chicago because I did not want him anywhere near the neighborhood where I was at. Yeah. When I called him, I drove a few hours out of the way to get to a talk to him from somewhere else. And... Anyway, we met him. I gave him the pictures and that, um, or copies of pictures for a lot of them. You know, I kept the negatives. And, and anyway, on the way home, um, I didn't know about it until a week or two later, but um, he flew his small plane out there. Out of Chicago to Lincoln. Yeah, and over Aurora, Illinois, his plane supposedly broke apart. It was blown up. Hmm. They never found the back seat. They found pictures all over the place. And they never found his briefcase either. Yeah. And anyway, the um, uh, deputy that had arrived at the scene was there just shortly. A um, matter of just a few minutes, and the FBI got there, and they told him that he was to keep his mouth shut. He was not to talk to anyone about this. Because he had the picture the deputy did. Yeah. And anyway, the deputy, um, he started talking about it about a year later. And his wife was murdered. Oh, man alive. Jeez. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, she's a He will not talk to anybody about it. Yeah. Rusty, do you, and you don't have to answer it if you don't want to, but do you have any pictures still that you know where they are and nobody else does? I still have pictures. Okay. And okay. they've been put away for safekeeping. Good. Good. Um, uh, but you got your life insurance policy, Rusty. Yep. That's kind of what I've been thinking. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know how good of a life it's insuring, but it's you know, it's been the last 10 years. Uh, Rusty, it's going to change, and uh, I hope that uh, all of us can help you out in some way. But I want to thank you for being on with us tonight, and uh, hopefully we can do it again, too. Rusty, I'll be in touch, friend. You take care, and God bless. Well, thanks, Alex. I appreciate it. Thanks, you have a great Rick. evening now. Thank thanks. you. Thanks, well, Rusty. You too. You're welcome. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Brave young man, Ted. Yeah, it's breathtaking, wasn't it? My gosh. I mean, unbelievable. Um, let's take a quick break. I'm going to get Noreen Gosh on with us. So Good. everybody stay where you are. I'm Alex Merklinger with Ted Gunderson, and we are going to get Noreen Gosh. have to pull you down because we have an important show here. We have not only my great co-host, Ted Gunderson, but we have Noreen Gosh. Noreen, thanks so much for coming back and being with us again. Oh, well, you're very welcome. Oh, boy. Thank you me. for having me on again. Well, you know it's always a pleasure. You heard Rusty's interview. I did. And, of course, you heard John's and, 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 and Jim's also. Mm-hmm. I guess the first thing I'd, I'd like to ask and bring up, we've asked each of these men the same question, and that is knowing what they do about Johnny and this guy, 
Gannon. What did they think? Noreen, each of them said they thought it was Johnny. I know. What do you think? Yeah, I've heard everybody say that. Yeah. And um, there's certainly many things that point to it, but Gannon put on his website <laughs> that it, he's not. <laughs> oh, he did? Yeah. Hmm. You well, mean Johnny Guy, you probably was forced to do that. Yeah, I think so, too. He, um, maybe he thought by putting that on there, he could avoid the uh, DNA test. I, maybe, I don't know. Now, tonight he was supposed to be on Bill Mayer's show uh -huh. at 10 o'clock. And I don't know if that was 10 o'clock Eastern. Probably. Or Central. Yeah, probably Eastern but, time. Um, that was on the Internet tonight, and he's going to do that show. Well, let me let me ask anybody out there if they happen to hear it or uh, any reports on it. If you would email me, maybe before the show is over tonight, we could at least check into it and see what was said. Mm -hmm. I've seen the Bill Mayer show a few times, and he really gets right to the point with um, a subject. So it probably was an interesting show tonight. Well, yeah, it, you know, but. It goes back if he if he doesn't want to meaning uh, Gannon if he doesn't want to say anything and he is he has an agenda that's mm -hmm. probably the way it's going to be. Uh, you're probably right. He uh, I think is like you said running his own agenda. Yeah. Whatever that might be, and it might just simply be for self preservation too. Hmm. Because he's in a hot spot right now. He sure is. Yeah, I'll say. But he put himself there. Yeah, that's true. But the motivation uh, would be interesting to, to learn or to know what his motivation is. I mean, mm -hmm. I can't figure it out. I, initially, I said, I thought maybe he was trying to get back and get even with him. Well, that, that's what I thought, too, Ted. Yeah, but, uh, you know, if he's going to get even with him, it seems like he should come forward now. But he's not coming forward now, no. saying he's not him. No. So I don't know what's going on. And I, if I said I'd, I, I would be guessing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I just got an email from one of our listeners, and he said, they chopped off your interview with Rusty on this leg, meaning up there of the net, when you got to the part of Oregon guards and the death of four inmates. <laughs> Oh well, there, there, what's, what's new? <laughs> yeah, there there are a lot of people who who do not like some of the things I talk about, and they will do everything in their power to uh, to blow me off the air. Well, where where was he? Uh, do, do you mean this one? Uh, all the internet uh, transmissions were killed at that time. Just 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 part, uh, because we're we're out on on several different uh, connections, and I'm not sure what you 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 call it, but. Uh, somehow they're able to knock down one of those connections, and it it, it, it cuts off a whole bunch of listeners. M remember, we we got listeners in all these different countries around, so we'll see. Well, that's typical. That's a, that's uh, average. That, that's the way yeah, it works. Right. Uh, right. These people have all the power. Not all the power. We have the power from God, but they have the techn technological experience and expertise and the money, yeah, to uh, and they own many of the big corporations, including some of the phone companies. I'm sure. Oh, they sure do. My heavens, yes. Yep. And uh, I had one of my associates recently uh, called his daughter, and instead of him getting a hold of his daughter, there was this blood curdling scream on there. So he hung up and he called again, and the daughter answered. You know. Jeez. They're game players. Yep, they sure are. Noreen, did you ever, ever have any? Um, response from your interview the other night? Yes, I've gotten a great many emails from people that have listened to the show. Well, oh. in fact, all of the shows that you've done this week, Alex. Oh, that's and great. Ed, and uh, one lady in particular, I forwarded that email to you. Did you get it? Uh, yes, I did. I yeah. did get it. It was a woman who has was a victim of uh, sexual abuse, and she had written to me saying how thankful she was for the shows that Alex has done this week. Good. And to bring this out, because it's really been helpful. That's your stuff on the back, Alex. Well, uh, yeah, but it's not me, Ted. It's people like you and Noreen. And well, but uh, if you didn't provide the form yeah, you, to you, it, you, you died. it wouldn't be done. Well, thanks, guys. And but uh, there I, are people out there that are hearing this and identifying with it, and it means a lot to them. 
to be able to hear the truth yeah. and to know that they're not alone. Really? What about what are some of the other emails say? Um, many of them are just saying that uh, they, they're behind us. They believe what all we have shared about Johnny, the Franklin Credit Union cover-up, all of this, the information that we've brought out in this week, and how they can people can see how it ties together, mm. and they wonder how on earth these young people who have been the victims you know, get on with their lives, survive yeah. their life, and, um, you know, and what becomes of them later. But that, that, great, there's a great deal of concern out there for these kids. It has to have a devastating effect on their lives. Mm -hmm. It Forever. would be... Yeah. Well, those that live. I was just going to say that, 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 that Noreen. Yeah, because it, it, it's one thing when we talk about, you know, how it has screwed up so many lives, but... Of the thousands and thousands of kids that have been kidnapped, how many are still alive? Mm -hmm. How many have they? I, you know, it's it's it, it's beyond imagination when when you hear somebody like Rusty Nelson talk to us, and even getting from uh, John DeCamp and uh, and Jim Rothstein about the number of kids, and they kill them, and they do it for either satanic ritual or to make a movie out of. I mean, mm -hmm. this is this is beyond imagination. And then they sell the movie. And then they sell the movie, yeah. Uh, God. Well, there was, uh, I, there was an article written about 10 or 12 years ago. That I think I said this earlier on one of, your, one of these shows. Yeah. Uh, uh, they estimate 2,500 children uh, a year are kidnapped and murdered. But I think it's higher than that. I do, too. Yeah, mm -hmm. I do. Because as a cult alone, satanic cult human sacrifices alone is going to be more than that. Jeez. What are some of the other emails that have to say, Noreen? Um, a lot of people have expressed their prayers for me, for Johnny, uh, especially in this latest situation with Gannon yeah. and whether or not he might be Gannon. Um, mm. And if he's not Gannon, then continuation of prayers and good wishes wherever he's at. But um, mm. I think the majority of people that have written to me believe that it is him by what they've put in their emails. Well, and, and they've all, a lot of them have expressed when, when is there going to be the DNA test? Has that been agreed upon? And all of that. And we have, we don't have that yet. I don't think he's going to do it, do you? I don't think so either. No. What, um, uh, how, many of the, how many emails did you receive, roughly? I think I've probably gotten about 10 or 15, and some of them did it in a straight email to me, and some of them did it in the feedback section of my website, hmm. where you have a chance to just type in a little paragraph or whatever you want based on the information from the website as well, and it's a convenient way to do it, but they had also watched this show because we or listened to this show because we had put... Um, information on the website letting people know that these shows were coming up and that helps get the word out there because I've had I get a lot of hits on my website I bet you do do you have any did you have any negative emails not one not one and they don't and dare stick their head up and a lot of times when there's a cross section of people with you know thoughts and opinions you know sometimes you'll get a comment or two where they don't agree but that this didn't happen this time Hmm. People have been very um, glued to the radio, actually, to hear all facets of this story. Uh, Alex, let me ask you about your emails. Yes, sir. Tell, tell us about them. <clears throat> well, I, I'll tell you real quick. Right now, I have uh, in emails 1,814 up My there. Goodness. Well, we get a tremendous, tremendous amount every day. And uh, so many of them, uh, I, I probably will get a hundred or more a day uh, in reference to the show. I'm talking about Johnny and and uh, people throwing support our way and saying, you know, because I said, you know, because a lot of people have have tried to have me not do this because they're either afraid for me because of all the strange things. I mean, look, look at all the people that have been killed mm -hmm. so far. Just people who have wanted to 
to open this up before the public, and all of a sudden they end up dead. You know, they. Well, some of them have opened it up and they ended up dead. At, that, right. Uh, so many, many people around the world are, are very concerned. I said, well, I'm, I'm sorry, I've got to do it though. I mean, because this, this is the worst thing that is facing humanity today, and and. Um, it's so all pervasive, and it starts from the satanic belief. I mean, how how can these people um, turn away from from God and uh, and idolize Satan with with the agenda that the Satanist movement has, and then just start to bring that down because the the pedophilia and the kidnapping of the children is only one part of what the satanic movement is all about. And people don't want to know it, and they try everything they can to either turn away from it or pretend I didn't hear that or something. And now you haven't had time to read eighteen hundred and fourteen, but no. Uh, did you, I assume you skimmed through them? You see any negative ones in there? No, no. I've never had a negative one about it. <laughs> don't you find too that a lot of people really want to know what they can do to help? Well, this is why, Noreen, I, I ask you to come back on with us because this is something I think all of us would like. I mean, I, I just cry out inside, what, what can we do? You know, because all over the world, this is not just a problem in Nebraska. This is not just a problem in the United States or even North America. This happens worldwide. I mean, look, look after the tsunami down in, uh, in, in Sumatra and that whole area and the people that were grabbing these little children Mm -hmm. And they were going to sell them or, or, or put them into the same program that Johnny and other kids have been put in. So this has got to stop. You know, Jesus said, suffer not the little children. Well, I know Jim Rothstein and I were talking about it today. Mm -hmm. And he, too, and I think it was mentioned on the show by John DeCamp and maybe even Jim the night he was on, about the need for the task force. Yes. Oh, yeah, that, that's... That'd be fantastic. Mm -hmm. To be given the opportunity yep. and the, um, you know, leverage and everything money. To, to act. Mm -hmm. But that takes money there again. Um, but people are going to have to speak out and do something because it's getting out of control. It's completely out of control. Well, do you think it's getting worse, Noreen, or? I think it is. Do you really? Gosh. There's, it's being publicized more, that's for yeah. sure. But on the other hand, there are more kids uh, that seem to be taken, and there's much more news coverage on it, too. Yeah. Noreen, you have to speak up, remember. There's, there's much more yeah. news coverage on it than ever before. <sighs> and that brings it to our attention. Yeah. And I know some people say, well, it's only because it's in the news that you hear about it that you think there's more. But I disagree. I think there are more cases than well, we've ever seen before. Yeah, just, so. just working with the um, the increase in population around the world, mm -hmm. yeah, you could really see where this is exactly what could happen. And if we don't value the lives of small children, young children, then what kind of a nation will we become? We're fast on our way. Yeah. And I think that we're in a state of moral decay. Hmm. Well, the children who are molested now will end up being perpetrators themselves, mm -hmm. and uh, it'll magnify itself. Well, it's all, it, all, it, it all goes back to uh, the Illuminati slash satanic movement in this mm -hmm. country. Jeez. And uh, but when you get to the point where there's a human life is not valued, then you've got real problems in a society. No, that's and it. we're seeing evidence of that with the young people. Um, when I think back to all that I've been through since day one of Johnny's kidnapping and what that young man had to go through, yeah. Yeah. It, is, it is a horrible, horrendous thing for um, any family to have to endure. Noreen, have you heard, or maybe Ted, have you heard... <clears throat> What is this program, uh, what's entailed in this program for the, once they kidnap a child, what did they go through, uh, how long does the, the programming last? I mean, because I know they torture them, they, 
they get them onto drugs, they uh, they, they they molest them. I mean, what well, is sleep, the sleep deprivation, food deprivation, hypnosis, yeah. combination of all that. Drugs, the yeah. sexual abuse, and then once they have them indoctrinated to a point where the kids doesn't, the, the kids just don't know from what. Yeah. Uh, then they force them to commit a felony, usually, because that is also leverage, and it puts the fear factor into them that they could never run off and go to the police for help. And often, they, they, they let them know, well, you've yeah. committed a felony. Yeah, and oftentimes that felony is uh, murder. Mm-hmm. And not only that. Yeah, but yeah. In, in That's correct. They put the kids, they bring their children in for a human sacrifice, and I've talked to a number of survivors who told me this. And they put the knife above the victim's whatever. Yeah. And the body in a particular location. It's all part of the ritual. And the child's hand is on the knife. And they tell the child to stash it or to go forward with it, to stab the person. And the children don't do it. So an adult comes along and puts his hand over top of hers and stabs the person. And then they tell the kid, see what you've done? And then that, that's where the guilty complex comes Jeez. in. And that's where they blackmail the kids. Mm-hmm. Is that right, Noreen? Well, that's, what, that's exactly what Paul Benassi described. Is that yeah, right? And I've talked to probably, well, I, I guess in my 25 years, I've interviewed over 200 of these survivors. Mm-hmm. Really? My gosh. I heard Rusty make reference to this uh, federal trial a court case in um, Lincoln, Nebraska in 1999. I was in that courtroom when Rusty told that whole story to the judge. What was that, Norman? I beg your pardon? What, what, when was that? The story? That was when Paul Benassi sued and won oh, against yeah. Larry King. Yeah. And I was in the courtroom, and that was when I met Rusty for the first time. And I listened to him relate just about everything that he did tonight on the radio for the judge. Mm. Is there anything he said in the courtroom he didn't say tonight? Only the recent material, just about Gannon and anything that would be added since 1999. But everything that he related tonight about how it all worked, the the organization, how the very thing, um, how it worked. You right interacted and treated him. He also spent time talking about how he got into this in the first place. Yeah. Who the person was that introduced him to Larry King. Soto, he said. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Tell us about Soto. Did you mention Soto the other night, Marine? I didn't. You want to tell us about him? Well, he was a private investigator in Des Moines. Huh. And uh, Rusty and Paul Bonassi both have identified him. Rusty identified him as the man who introduced him to Larry King and that he was part of this whole network. Rusty, or excuse me, Paul Benassi pitched his photograph out of a lineup of photographs and told Roy Stevens, the private investigator, that that is the man who brought the photographs of Johnny to a motel room the night before the kidnapping and said, this is the boy that we're going to take tomorrow. And on the back of the photograph, which was an 8 by 10 there was a diagram and a, an outline of our house and the street where Johnny would walk up to the corner and then his how he would start his route. And Paul Benassi saw all of this, and he, he um, described this man, the way he acted, the way he dressed, he even described his after-shave lotion that, or cologne that he always wore. And this was just from seeing a black and white picture of the man. And he identified him as Soda. And he said the kids all called him Soda Pop. Mm. Who was in that room, do you know? Which room? When Soda showed the picture, this is the boy we're going to kidnap tomorrow. In the motel room, the yeah. Nazi said that Emilio was there, another man named Tony, and then Soda, and Benassi, and then there was another kid, and he said his name was Mike. Yeah, nobody knows what happened to Michael. Nobody knows his last name. Sometimes he called him Mikey. 
Yeah. And he was there, too. But um, How old was uh, Paul at that time? Paul is about four years older than Johnny, so Paul would have been about 16 going on 17. Boy. At the time, I kidnapped nothing. You know, this is, it's draining, isn't it? I mean, you you get so emotionally involved and, mm -hmm. and, and you hear the stories and for for a normal person, it, this is so far outside of their normal uh, thinking process that it, it, it almost freaks people out. Well, it does. And I can remember back to the morning of the kidnapping and Johnny was missing and, you know, we didn't know what had happened. And I started calling the newspaper manager and I got the names of all the kids that were at the corner that morning. So yeah. I called each one of the houses. And I started hearing this story about this man in a car and he stopped Johnny and a second man who followed him down the street and the slamming of the car door and the car screeching the tires as it took off. Yeah. Well, all of a sudden it was just like spinning a nightmare right before me. I thought, what? What's happened here? You know, your mind can't catch up fast enough right. after right. something like this happens. And um, thank God we had witnesses. Mm. Because in a lot of kidnappings, yeah, you have true. a bicycle that they find yeah. or a wagon, and nobody saw anything. So at least we had witnesses. So I am thankful tremendously for that. Right. What happened to the uh, the new latest witness, Noreen, that's come forward in the last two or three weeks? Did anybody do anything with that? Anybody take affidavits or statements or anything? We haven't done anything with it just yet. Um, the young man, I'm not so sure, he still lives in West Des Moines. Um, his father still lives in the same house. And the father is the one that was questioned by a news team that was here doing the story from another city. And they came to my house to... This, this is three, three weeks ago, right? Yeah. And they came to my house to interview me after they had been up at the location where Johnny was kidnapped and had talked to this man, this boy's father. So when they came here, they began relating the whole story. I said, oh. what? What are you talking about? Because yeah. this is not what was released to the public. And so I told them that. And then that same news team drove up to Minnesota to interview Jim Rothstein. And they told him the same thing. That the father said, oh, yeah, that's exactly what happened. And that's what we told the police. But the police told a different story and told us to keep quiet. Wow. So, you see, we had even a further eyewitness that actually saw uh -huh. Johnny being stuffed in the car. And, it, like I said, he just des described him being shot with something right. like a stun gun. Have you and talked to the family? I haven't gone up there yet, no. Okay. And... Uh, the reason we waited is because it might be better if it was handled in more of an official capacity than just me. Yeah, but who can you get to do that? Because it, it, it seems like the police don't want to well, cooperate. I'm not, not going to involve the police. We'll get it through some other manner. Through we'll, professional. We'll get an affidavit or something signed. Yeah. No, I don't run anything through the police. No. Is John DeCamp aware of this new witness? I did tell him about it on the phone. Boy. Uh, shortly after it happened. <coughs> and, and, see, that's very important. That's, you know, just the fact that there was the eyewitness. And, well, to Rothstein and, or and the, somebody of Rothstein's uh, experience or my experience should go interview these people mm -hmm. and take statements. Exactly. Oh, yeah, my And gosh, that's yes. what we're, we're kind of waiting for because I don't want... Um, I didn't want a bunch of people charging up this year no, no, you're right. scaring the guy off. And now that this whole thing has erupted with Gannon, I don't want them to become so afraid again that they won't talk. No, I, you're right. It does, uh, either Ross Dean or I should go interview and people. And see, that's why I didn't go charging yeah, over there. Yeah, that's a good idea. I just thought, no, it's probably better if it's handled in a different manner. you got to have a professional do it. Mm -hmm. Oh, I agree. And one that's prepared to take a, an affidavit right on the spot. Absolutely. Now, Noreen, let's say um, you interview or Ted goes and interviews the father, um, and the father says all the things that happened and uh, wherever the son is, and I don't know, but let's say the son is also. It would be best if we found the son because he's the one that saw. Yeah. Well, Ross, maybe Rustin and I should both join the room together. Well, that'd be all right. But what what would it mean? 
uh, to the case. It would open up a lawsuit that you could uh, go after the, I guess, the, the town, right? If they would be willing to go on record and say that they told the police such and such and yeah. the police told a different story, that, I'm not an attorney, but I would think that would be grounds for a lawsuit. Absolutely. I would think so, sure. Because that would be falsifying, you know, information, and based on that, the FBI would not come into the case because they said we had no crime. And the police chief kept saying, well... We have no crime yeah. because nobody saw your boy being stuffed into a car. And That's yet it was the police. And, you know, if that police chief was still alive, yeah. upon hearing that the other day, I'm not so sure I wouldn't have gone right to his house. Is he dead now? Yeah, he died of a heart attack. Well, they probably killed him. I don't know. How, how long ago did he die? About two and a half years. Oh, so it's not that long ago. No. And when he died, uh, it was just kind of funny because the newspaper called me that af the afternoon afterwards yeah. and wanted me to make a statement, when, you know, and told me he was dead. And I said, no comment. <laughs> well, then they called back a little later and they wanted me to make a statement, and I said, no comment. Good for you. And then they finally called back a third time, and they said, well, you know, we would like you to make a statement about uh, his death. And I said, what part about no comment do you not understand? Yeah, right. Excellent. And you know what the reporter said? What? He said, well, damn, he said, we can't get anybody to say anything nice about him either. <laughs> oh, God. That's what he said. And I said, well, you know, I guess you have to consider the source. And I wouldn't say anything else. Good. Well, what? Because, Go ahead. you know, if I did and began to launch out with the truth, all they would remember is, oh, Nareen Gosh spoke ill of the dead. They would not have re believed what I had to say. Really? Nareen, cool. uh, what, what was the, um, the uh, TV news crew, where were they from? From Waterloo, Iowa. It oh. was Dave Roberts from KWWL, and they did a very successful show. Um, they did a, the interviews here. They talked about Gannon. They talked to this boy's father. They drove up to Minnesota to see Rothstein. Oh. And then they ran it. And then mm. they told Jim that they were going to, this was after the story ran, that they were going to do some kind of a follow-up piece. And I don't know what that will be. Did uh, anybody nationally pick it up, pick up on it? In where? Nationally. Not yet. What about the Des Moines area? Mm -mm. Mm. Um, I'm thinking, though, that if they do another story, and I guess this young reporter's boss was really behind them and very supportive, Good when he, especially when they found out that there had been a little bit of a fib, shall we say? A, a little bit of a fib? I'm trying to be generous. I know you are. That's my gosh. And see, that's the thing right now, and for a very long time now, yeah. as these things are coming out, Boy. Yes, it upsets me. It upsets me a lot. Yeah. But I can't afford mm. to allow it to blow my circuits. True. You can't. This many years into it, yep. it's detrimental to a person's health. Yeah, I agree. And I can't afford to have my blood pressure being shooting over the top over every little thing that comes in. It just has to be handled. And handled. And then we'd figure out a plan, but I really try to remain extremely calm. And that's, that's for my welfare too, because I wouldn't have lasted this long had yeah. I just gone berserk over every little thing. It's true. I, you, I could be, I can be more effective when I'm calm. You know, you would think that, uh, somebody besides the Waterloo TV station would do a story on this. Well, Des Moines is not, wanting to do much more, a lot of times they will respond and do something after it's been done in another area. And that's been just the last couple of years hmm. on the story. Is Jim Gannon still working with the Des Moines Register? Oh, no. He moved on from Des Moines, and I think he moved to either New York or Washington and was doing something in the media there. I'm not sure what it was, but he, he went on to Greener Pastures. 
That was a reward for uh, putting uh, clamps on your story. One of the things that I've been getting a lot of emails about, there's a local talk show here, um, Jan Michelson Show. Huh. And I've been on his show, and it goes pretty wide range through the Iowa area. A lot of people listen to it. And a lot of people have been writing me, telling me that they had contacted the station. Hmm. asking Jan to put me on the air about this Gannon issue. And people are getting very frustrated because he won't do it or he hasn't done it. He wow. hasn't even called me to do it. And the listeners in this Iowa area who have been listening to your show, Alex, yeah. have called the local guy here and says, well, it's everywhere else. Why aren't you putting me on the air? <laughs> but they haven't. Yeah. What, and so then they're speculating that maybe he was told not to, or yeah. I'm not sure what the reason is. Unbelievable, isn't it? But I, I will say this. When I was on his show, after my book came out, he was very complimentary about the book, and he said that he and his wife both read it, like, in two nights. Each one of them had the book for one night. Yeah. And while we were on the air, and it was live, he said... Well, lady, he said, you really have a lot of gall. <laughs> really? He said, you accused Barney Frank and Craig Spence of all those things that they supposedly did in Washington, D.C. Where do you get off doing that? And I said, every single bit of it was a proven fact. Yeah, right. And I exactly. said, if you went back and researched the 92 articles in the Washington Times, from the year 1988 through 1989, I said, you would have the same information I do. And I said, I guess maybe you didn't do your homework before this interview. Yeah, right. Oh, and I said, who was this? Jan Michelson. Oh, this was Jan. Yeah. And he laughed. He says, well, I knew you'd have an answer for that. But <laughs> you know, I get along fine, you know, and I just, I told him, I said, you know, anything I put in that book is what we've researched and we found to be true. I sure. didn't put in things that had not already been established because I didn't want legal problems. Hmm. Then you ended up a legal problem with that other character. Yeah, but nothing over... Anything. Nothing over what you put in the book. No, no. Uh, no. Wow. No. Would, you, would you want to comment on that? Um, would you rather not? Well, I might as well. Sure, you betcha. There was a man that um, assisted, and he kept calling and wanting to assist with the book. And he uh, did some research because he owned some books that had um, information about MK Ultra, which I was going to include in the book. Mm -hmm. And so that's that's about all he provided. You see, I had quite a few of the chapters of my book written. I had the first first two written by 1984. And what I would do is write and take from my notes things that were happening, and I would write it all up in story form so I wouldn't forget it, number one, and so there would be an accurate record of it, number two. Well, this guy um, had written books also, but they were mostly stories about, um, and books with a lot of pictures, and it was not a book like this one. Mm. And... Um, after the book was published, or he was living in Missouri, and he kept wanting to be a part of this project, and I said to him, well, what's in it for you? Well, he says, I just want to see this, the truth get out. I don't want anything. And uh, when he came to Des Moines, he would come over and would work a couple of days a week, and the rest of the time, I don't know what he did. But I was working in my job as well while I was still writing the book. And um, got the book published. He came to my home about three months after the book was out and demanded $25,000 in cash for his assistance. What? Jeez. Yeah. He claims that he put in 1,200 hours on the book. It was just a complete farce. Oh my and gosh. he claimed that the whole idea for the book was his. And many times he tried to, when we would be working on something, 
he would keep trying to tell me, well, it has to be this way, it has to be that way. And I'd remind him repeatedly, Wow. it's my son, my story, yeah. and my book. And a couple of times I told him to get out of my home. Oh, my heavens. And that he was no longer a part of anything. <sighs> and that it was my son, my story, and my book. Well, he then filed a lawsuit against me for $25,000. Oh, <laughs> now, I had to borrow the money to get that book published. And I was working two part-time jobs while I was doing the book and then taking on the project of doing a book at the same time. And throughout the entire mm. investigation on Johnny's case, with the exception of the last year when I was writing the book, yeah. I had a full-time eight-hour job a day, oh, boy. plus two part-time jobs that I would do throughout the week. So I was working days and nights, and I was working weekends. Mm. I didn't have anything like a day off for years and years. And um, the book, you know, the expenses that we've had on Johnny's case for detectives mm. and all of the money that has had to go out for just doing the things that the police didn't do came to close to three quarters of a million dollars. Oh, my, oh my gosh, Noreen. Yeah. And we didn't get big donations and things like that. Not at all. We did fundraisers like... Um, garage sales, they did bake sales, the neighbors pitched in and did a lot of that type of fundraisers. Yeah. People threw benefit dances, there was a few of those, and then all the rest of it was either from what I could raise as my extra jobs, or when I was on the national speaking circuit, mm. every speaking fee that I got went into the bank to pay detectives. And you see, that was all money that I shouldn't have had to come up with. But I did it because the police were not helping me and the FBI wouldn't come into the case. Few people realize what it has cost me to try and find my son. I mean, it has been 22 years of just absolute stress. Yeah. And I don't just mean stress of losing him. Stress of, are you going to have enough money to keep it going? And that would just give me nightmares at night. But what if you run out of money and you can't keep it going? You're going to have to give up working to find your boy. Yeah, right. And so that's why I always kept working extra jobs. I had my daytime office job as an office manager. And then I worked for a fragrance company. And then I taught um, classes at night. Wow. Noreen, uh, you'd be interested in this. Tell us about, and when you, when you tell this story, and I have a follow-up to it, about the throwing the coffee cup at the FBI agent. Yes. What? Six months after Johnny was kidnapped, another boy from Des Moines was kidnapped from the high school parking lot where he was attending school. And the kidnappers jumped into his El Dorado Cadillac hmm. and took the boy and then made a call to the parents on the kid's car phone for ransom demand. Now, it so happened that that family was very wealthy. Mm -hmm. um, the grandfather invented the vending machine. Does hmm. that give you a clue? Yeah. As to how much money that they're worth? Okay. So the FBI jumped on that one. They brought in agents from Quantico, Virginia. They had SWAT teams. They had everything. They got the kid back in 36 hours. Wow. Unharmed. Well, the next day, a representative from the West Des Moines Police and then a man named Herb Hawkins, who was a special agent in charge from the Omaha office of the FBI, plus our local FBI agent <coughs> here, all came to our house. Um, I think they just wanted to gloat about, 
you know, solving the other case. Yeah. And I was just making coffee, mm. and they came in, <laughs> and uh, Herb Hawkins said to me, oh, man, he says, we really had to work on that case. There was a human life at stake. And by this time, they had moved to the table, and they were sitting down, and Herb mm. was sitting in Johnny's chair at the table. Yeah. And I was pouring the coffee and putting the mugs on a tray to carry over to the table. And when he said that, that there was a human life at stake, I said, uh, well, what, what, what do you call my son? I said, you all wouldn't enter Johnny's case. You still haven't. What is this about a human life in the other case? And he said, Mrs. Gosh, there's something you don't understand. The other family were prominent people. Oh, my gosh. They are very well. <clears throat> we oh. had to start looking for their boy right away. And that did it. Yeah, I, I put down the coffee pot. I picked up a full mug of coffee, and I hurled the cup across the room and missed Herb Hawkins' face by a quarter of an inch. The whole cup or just the cup? The whole cup. Wow. Well, they jumped up and started yelling at me and all sorts of things, and he wanted to know. He says, I can see you're overwrought. What can I do for you? I said, I can get out of my house. I said, if you're not going to look for my boy, I said, step aside because I'm coming through. Good for you. And I threw them out of the house. Yeah. Well, then Ken Wooden, who had investigated pedophiles for many, many years, used to work for CBS. He was a friend of mine. A few days later, he called me, and he said, Hey, babe, what is this I hear about you throwing a coffee cup at Herb Hawkins? And I said, How did you hear about it? Yeah. He said, Well, I was at the White House for a dinner with Ronald Reagan, and William Webster, head of the FBI, and some other dignitaries were coming in. And he said, I was sitting there wearing my Johnny Gosh button on my suit, and he said Herb ha or, um, William Webster was very disgusted and upset when he got to the meeting. And he said, oh, I just had to deal with some agent out in Omaha because some crazy woman in Iowa threw a cup of coffee at him. <laughs> <laughs> and Kim Wooden picked up, you know, kind of put oh, up when he heard Iowa. And he says, uh, well, with that, what was her name? Yeah. And... Webster said, Noreen Gosh. Oh, my gosh. And my friend Ken said in front of the president, he said, if that woman lost control for even 30 seconds, it's because your agent said something that was deplorable. Good. He got out of line or she never would have reacted yeah, that way. good. He said, I know her. And Noreen and Ted, we're out of time. Okay. That's a real quick note. Yes, sir. I know Herb Hawkins. I sent him a copy of your book, Noreen. You sent who a copy? Herb Hawkins, a copy of your book. You did? I never heard back from him. <laughs> I'm not.